calling officially. I'm calling uh, or to order the regular Emeryville Planning Commission meeting of May 27th, 2021, uh, and the time is 6:30. Um, so. This is when I always read the COVID script. Um, I'd like to state for the record, this meeting is being conducted by teleconference pursuant to the Brown Act waiver provided under the governor's executive order in response to the COVID-19 state of emergency. During this public health emergency, City Hall is closed to the public. The agenda states the public may view the meeting uh, that is being live streamed on uh, online and ETV channel 27 and provide comment by submitting an online comment form which will then be read into the record by staff. The comment uh, form can be accessed by going to our main city of Emeryville website at www.emeryville.org and by navigating to the planning commission page. Once there, uh, you will see a link, submit an online speaker card. The public also has the option of participating in tonight's meeting via Zoom and may provide um, public comment during the meeting by using the raise your hand function um, visible on your screen or if you're calling in, press star nine. The Zoom call-in information was provided on the posted agenda, and there's a link on the Planning Commission uh, agenda page as well. Um, so, uh, Charlie, can we have a roll call? Yes, Commissioner Chafe. Here. Commissioner Keller. Here. Commissioner Mendez. Here. Commissioner Simons. Here. Commissioner Zepko. Here. Vice Chair Young. Vice Chair Young is here. Can you hear us, Vice Chair Young? Or is, is he frozen? Mike isn't on, which means uh, he hasn't joined with audio. I see, okay, and Chair Thompson. Here. Well, we have six commissioners and Commissioner Young is having connection issues, apparently. Okay, great. Um, at least we have enough people to run the meeting and we'll uh, get the final commissioner online hopefully soon. Okay. Um, okay, now it is the time for public comment portion of this meeting. Anyone who wishes to make comment related to an item not on the agenda should have begun the submittal uh, of your online speaker card by now. Um, if you're participating in, uh, sorry, three minutes will be uh, a lot allowed for the city clerk to read your comments into the record. Um, if you're participating in tonight's meeting via Zoom, please use the raise your hand function. Um, or if you're calling in, use uh, press star nine. The clerk will call at you at the appropriate time. Um, at this time, uh, Charlie, uh, have any comments been received by online comment card? I have or not, anyone raise their hand? I have not received any online comment cards. And let me double check. I do not see any raised hands among the attendees. So okay, as long as we're not seeing any, anyone jumping up and down. Um, okay, hearing no additional requests to make comments, uh, the public comment portion of this meeting is now closed. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to address and speak on matters that are listed on the agenda when those respective items come up. Um, so from here, we, um, are looking at the approval of the action minutes of April 22nd, 2021. Are there Chair any Thompson, comments? Yeah. Before, before we, uh, the commission approves these minutes, I would like to recommend a correction, if I may. This was brought to my attention by Commissioner Keller. Uh, this correction is to item 8.1, the Emory Station Overland Study Session, and it's on page three of the minutes, um, the large paragraph towards the upper part of that page, a little over halfway through that paragraph, there's a sentence that says, a commissioner suggested having a bicycle and pedestrian path cutting through the site, et cetera. I would like to recommend deleting the word suggested and replacing it with stated that the general plan requires. So the sentence would now read, a commissioner stated that the general plan requires having a bicycle and pedestrian path cutting through the site directly from 62nd to 63rd Street, which was supported by most of the other commissioners. So with that, staff would recommend approval of the minutes with that correction. Okay. Um, I, I also just want to see if anyone else had any comments or corrections yes. that, that they wanted uh, to include before we move to approve them. Any comments? 
Um, okay, would someone like to move to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second that. All right. And let's see, I believe we had, well, that's right. Um, Commissioner Chafe? Aye. Commissioner Keller? Aye. Commissioner Mendez? Aye. Commissioner Simons? Aye. Commissioner Zepko? Aye. Vice Chair Young? Yes. Give a thumbs up. <laughs> and Chair Thompson? Aye. All right, we have six ayes and one uh, connection problem. Okay, um, fantastic. Uh, next on the agenda is the Community Development Director's Report. Yes, thank you. Um, brief report tonight. Uh, first on City Council actions. The City Council has had two meetings since the last meeting and those were on May 4th and May 18th. There were not a lot of planning related items on those agendas on May 4th. Uh, in honor of a former city council member, Nora Davis, as recommended by the Commission on Aging, the council voted to name a day of service after uh, former council member Davis. And then during my planning director's report on the uh, April 22nd planning commission meeting, uh, a public speaker commented on the Emory Station Overland project and stated that there was inadequate parking on 62nd Street adjacent to the project. On May 18th, the council held a study session on the same objective standards issues paper that the commission uh, had considered at your April 22nd meeting. The council benefited from having the item earlier in the evening than you did. And uh, we attempted to make the presentation more focused and concise. And as a result, the council was able to get through all of the issues and gave good direction and feedback to staff. Uh, they did not feel the need for a special joint meeting with the planning commission as staff had suggested but they did ask that if the commission holds a special meeting on this topic that staff provide a follow-up report to the council summarizing the commission's comments which we of course will do and that brings me to my other item which is about the special commission meeting as you re may recall at your last meeting you held that study session on the objective development standards and you indicated that you would like to hold a special meeting in order to continue that discussion. Uh, staff proposes to schedule a special planning commission meeting for that purpose uh, three weeks from tonight on Thursday, June 17th, starting at 6.30 p.m. And we'd appreciate the commissioner's uh, commission's feedback as to whether that time works for you or if another date would be preferable. So Chair Thompson, if we could just go around and ask the commissioners if that works for them. Um, sure, that'd be great. Um, I just, for the record, I will state that it, it does work for me, um, but uh, Commissioner Zepko? Maybe we could just ask if anyone has a conflict. Oh, okay. Does anyone have a conflict? I just need to quickly look at my calendar. So I'll look at that real quick here. I, I do oh. have a question. Um, will we get the, like a package before that meeting for us to review? Well, I believe it would be the same uh, report that you had before. Um, I mean, the, the main topic is the issues paper, which you already have. So I'm kind of hedging here because I'm not sure if we would put together an additional staff report, uh, maybe a brief one. One issue is since it would be only three weeks from now, we have a very, fairly short time to put something together, but we would have a new presentation at the meeting. Definitely. Okay. That works for me. Yeah, my calendar looks okay at that time. All right. I'm not hearing any conflicts. So we will schedule that special planning commission meeting for Thursday, June 17th at 6.30 PM. Uh, and of course that will all be properly noticed and so forth. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to entertain any questions on my director's report. Are there any questions? Okay, um, then we'll move forward in the agenda. Um, this is the portion where we disclose ex parte communications um, and identify any conflicts of interest. Uh, so on the ex parte communications, is there anyone who'd like to identify anything? 
Um, okay, the only thing I will identify is that the um, I did meet with the marketplace redevelopment uh, parcel A and B um, applicant. They are not on this agenda anymore. Uh, they're continued, um, but just to note that. So Chair, do we need, if that's not on the agenda tonight, do we need to make a disclosure or does that happen when they actually come on the agenda? Well, I think I, I was just gonna do it as, as both because it is technically on the agenda, even though it's continued, but. Okay, well, I did meet with them as well. Okay, okay. Um, and then are there any conflicts of interest with items on the agenda? I have a, I have a conflict of interest on. Uh, I have a oh. So, on Commissioner Mendez, why don't why don't you go first, and then we'll hear from Com Vice Chair Young. Sure. Um, on the marketplace redevelopment, I have a conflict of interest. I know it's not on the agenda today, um, but it is it is um, uh, listed on there. Um, so the marketplace. Uh, development is my place of <laughs> and I I think that's it right <laughs> yes okay um and then vice chair young we you are kind of going in and out still you want to make a comment now maybe you could try connecting by telephone He's completely there's, frozen. I don't think he's connected. <clears throat> there is a there is a yeah. phone number to call on the agenda. Okay. And then is Commissioner Chafe here? Yes. Did you have a conflict, Commissioner Chafe, on one I of do. the items? Yep. So on item seven point one, I'll need to recuse myself. Um, I can um, give the full reason now, um, if that's appropriate. No, you can just identify, and then we'll. We will give the full reason when we get to that. Um, okay, I think that's that's all in terms of the ex parte communications and conflicts. Unless there are any others. Okay. Um, so let's move on to our study session. Um, the first study session is 7.1, uh, the two unit replacement at 1270 64th Street. Good evening, Chair Thompson. Good evening, Commissioners. I'll be. Oh, excuse me. Um, Chair Thompson, sorry to interrupt. I believe this would be the appropriate time for Commissioner Chafe to identify her conflict. Right, yeah, officially. Okay, great. So I need to recuse myself from this agenda item involving 1270 64th Street. I own real property located at APN 49147126, which is within 500 feet of the project site. The property is my primary residence. So I will text you, Commissioner Chafe, when this item is concluded. Thank you. All right. And so now we're ready for the staff presentation. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll be making a presentation tonight and I'll of course be available for questions. The applicant also has a brief presentation for you this evening. All right, can everybody see the um, presentation slide? Yes. Yes. All right, so as mentioned, I'll be presenting on 1270 64th Street, a proposal to demolish two existing uninhabitable residential structures and replace them with two new residential structures. So here is location of that project on the north side of 64th Street between Doyle Street and Vallejo Street. For project background, the lot is just over 3,500 square feet. There are two vacant dilapidated structures on there. It's been a code enforcement site for many years and in 2018, multiple violation notices were issued, which resulted in a 2019 uh, court granted receivership of the property. In July, 2020, it was sold to the current owner. In December, 2020, the application before you was received by staff. So the project includes uh, two units. Each of them are three bedroom and two bath units. And each unit is about 1500 square feet. The project is 26 feet tall. And the front unit does have a one car garage as part so here are some existing photos. On the left side of the screen is the front unit, and on the right side of the screen is the rear unit. And what's proposed is the front unit there, again on the left side of the screen, and the rear unit shows up towards the back of the rendering on the right side. Here's the south elevation, so this would be facing 64th Street. This is what you would see as you went up and down 64th Street, and it's in context of the adjacent buildings. 
Here's the east elevation from the side. This is the rear of the property, the north elevation, and the west elevation of the proposed project. So we just did a little circle around the proposed buildings, and here are the site plans. The existing site plan is on the left side of the screen, and if you look towards the top of the screen, that is the rear of the property, and you'll see the existing building is actually substantially on the neighboring property. So demolishing that building will help bring uh, the site into conformance. On the right side of the screen is the proposed site plan, and you'll see there is no more buildings projecting over property lines. It conforms to all setback requirements. So the proposed first floor um, for both units on the left side of the screen there is common space. The front unit has a garage and both units have living, dining and kitchen and bathroom on the first floor. The second floor, which is in the middle of your screen is living space for uh, bedrooms. So three bedrooms and two baths. And then uh, there's the roof plan, of course, which has solar available. The landscaping plan uh, conforms to, to uh, requirements for um, a water efficient landscaping and here are renderings of the project so this is as if you're walking up 64th street walking from west to east and here's the front of the property and then as you go uh, towards the east side of the property and then walking down the east side of the property this is just a larger picture of the rendering you already saw and here's a materials board for the project it has uh, multiple types of wood siding So the land use classification here is medium density residential. It is in the North Hollis overlay and two unit developments are a permitted use in the RM zone. So the use itself does not require a conditional use permit. For zoning, the base FAR in this location is 0.5 with a bonus uh, FAR of up to 1.0. The proposed FAR is 0.83, so that's over the base. The residential density is two units, which is consistent with the base and is under 30 feet, which is a maximum building height in the area. As a project is fewer than 10 units, bonus points aren't required. Um, however, findings are required that it is compatible with the neighborhood and minimize the appearances of uh, garages and driveways and other car oriented features. So there's no parking minimum and the maximum number of vehicular parking spaces is two. The proposed number is one because of the shape of the lot and the maximum amount of, and trying to minimize, pardon me, the amount of visible auto orientation, it's very difficult to get more than one parking space on this site. There is no bicycle parking required for two unit projects, but the applicant is proposing two long term projects, uh, two long term bicycle parking spaces, pardon me. So all required setbacks are met. There again is no open space requirement for two unit uses, it's exempt. However, this project does have a rear yard for both units. And then 10% uh, of the lot area must be landscape and that is exceeded. Findings are for a conditional use permit. And then also for the development bonus, as we talked about before, that the project is compatible with the area and it's designed to minimize the appearance of auto oriented features. Design review is required because these are new buildings. And also for the demolition of residential units, even though they're uninhabitable and um, very dilapidated, the recommendation of planning commission is required before going to city council for approval where findings must be made for the demolition of the residential units. And a tree removal permit is also required. Um, as a standard practice, staff asked uh, the city consulting arborist for um, recommendations for a tree protection plan as will be a significant amount of construction here. But the arborist found that the tree was not in a condition that the, it should be saved. So a tree removal permit will be required. And that also has to be considered by the planning commission. Planning commission. And in cases where the need for a street tree removal is without fault of the property owner, the planning commission may waive certain requirements like to plant a replacement tree of equal value or payment of a replacement value fee for the tree. Staff comments for the project are that building a fire have provided preliminary feedback on the project already. Elevations need to show the proposed sliding doors shown in the plans for each unit. So each unit um, is proposed to have sliding doors opening from their common spaces on the first floor to the um, to their rear yards. This guards plan has yet to be developed. That's in the works and a city council study session is tentatively scheduled for July 6. So 
So for your consideration tonight, does the commission have any feedback regarding the overall design of the project? Does the commission feel that all required findings can be made? And does the commission feel that the requirement to plant a replacement tree um, of equal or cumulative value or payment of replacement value fee for the street fee, street tree should be waived considering that the applicant will need to plant a new street tree as part of this project? So that concludes my presentation and I'm available for questions. And as I mentioned, the applicant is also has a presentation for you tonight. Great, thanks Navar. Um, th now that this is the time when we, we have, are there any questions for staff? I have no questions. I have one question about um, whether the, whether it had been discussed um, what the parking situation would be should um, an additional cars arrive with the tenants since there is one parking space is there is it on street is it behind like what what was the recommendation what was the discussion even well there's no parking minimum so they could propose a project with no parking and it's a permitted permitted use so there was not a discussion about that okay so there was no discussion um okay they, any they other questions park, they would need to park on the street i think if they ever had more cars. Yeah, and, and that's, I, I just want to understand the situation in terms of the serviceability, not whether it's allowed or not. Uh, Commissioner Keller? Yeah, since you brought up the parking, I don't know if this is appropriate for staff or the applicant, but I do have concerns about the driveway. Um, it looks as if it is less than 15 feet deep from the, the public right of way in the garage door. And in doing some research, an average car like the size of an Audi A4 is about 15 feet. So I'm concerned that if the occupant decides not to use their garage and they park in the driveway, that we're going to have a car that encroaches on the public right away. So I was wondering if um, someone could address that, if it would be the applicant or, or staff, but it just doesn't look like the driveway is large enough to hold a small car, let alone the SUVs that most people drive today. Um, that might be a good question for the applicant. I would okay. suggest that perhaps you hear the applicant presentation first and okay. then see if they can answer that question. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Are there any other commissioner questions before the applicant presentation? Okay. Well, and at this time, I'd like to invite the applicant to present. All right. I am going to promote the names that I have for the applicants to the panel. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, let's see, Daniel, don't see Daniel. Uh, I'm here, but I think uh, Leo is supposed to present. He can go ahead. Is Leo here? Uh, yes, here? Uh, okay. I, I just got... Um... Andre and Bill are the two I'm looking for. Uh, we're, we're here as well. They're both with me on the uh, in the same room. I see. All right. Well, you may go ahead and uh, you can share your screen if you wish to, to uh, make your presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, let me see just a second. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you all. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me and uh, thank you Commissioner Keller for making that uh, comment. We'll certainly take that into consideration. Um, I'm, going, I'm just gonna walk you briefly through the project. This presentation does not reflect, in does not dive um, into the details of the act on elevations um, as uh, I, th I think it's, we're mostly focused on explaining the overall design of the project. <clears throat> so as uh, Navar Oaks explained, um, the existing conditions of the site is uh, two existing um, vacant updated structures. Um, and so we began tracing um, the overall setbacks um, required by the zoning code, as well as taking consideration the existing building um, is has a major encroachment into the neighboring unit. So we really wanted to adjust to the existing or the, the actual property line. Um, and so 
with the overall um, setbacks and put in place, um, I think our footprint is um, very constrained as to um, in order to achieve really the program that our, our client wanted to have for this uh, property, which is a three bedroom house, um, three bedroom houses um, each. Um, these are same pictures that, that Navar um, showed you um, earlier. Um, and these are some of our initial sketches where we wanted to maintain this scale of the neighborhood, um, considering that a the there really is a 30, 30 feet maximum height allowed um, on this zone, on this area. Um, but also, we're just trying to blend as much as possible with the existing neighborhood, which is only um, one or two story at most. Um, uh, and the front house, uh, we wanted to have a, a provide a, a garage initially, so we wanted the the massing was um, we manip we would, we're trying to manipulate the massing to focus um, the the pushback the the recess the garage further into the property, um, but we noticed that this would also sacrifice a lot of uh, livable space inside particularly because um, we we have um, it's a very tight space between the two units um, that we have on the property. Um, and so we wanted to we ended up manipulating the mass so as to um, break down the scale to a more pedestrian level um, by recessing the front entry door cantilevering what is um, over the non-pedestrian area and actually over the the garage instead, since we, we don't, um, I think the, the pedestrian um, ha access has more importance. Um, so once, you, once we dive into the floor plans, um, you really see um, how much space we have um, for the driveway and overall the, the, the remaining space for the, for the, for this, for the house. Um, each house has its own backyard and we provide privacy, um, by, um, having a fence around the perimeter of the, of the property, but also, um, through landscape. Um, these are some of the images that um, Navarro has already shown earlier. Shit. And as far as the aesthetic of the building, and we really wanted to have like a residential feel, very warm, um, to have the same siding as it, as it is mostly predominant in the in the in the neighborhood. Um, in contrast, um, the and create some a little bit of a contrast with the um, with the landscape. Um, as the landscape provides a little bit more like a purple or a green color, but also the trees, these are maple trees. Um, they tend to turn red into in the fall. Um, so I think overall the landscape with the, um, the wood in the back will create a very interesting um, appeal to the building. <clears throat> um, so this is it. Um, I think we can go back on this. There's a, there's questions on the presentation. So you're concluding your presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is the time when uh, the commissioners are invited to ask questions of the applicants. Are there questions? Okay, I have a question. Um, yes. uh, this is a study session, um, and this uh, we're being asked about the design component here. Um, and so, what I wondered is, do you have information on how uh, this is consistent with Emerville design guidelines and the North Hollis Area Urban Design Program? 
To my understanding, the North Hollis plan requires uh, street improvements on the on the uh, existing conditions. What we notice is that uh, the existing landscape strip, um, besides having the uh, the tree that is is now reported to be um, uh, unsustainable for construction, um, we are improving this uh, the the street by providing a continuous landscape strip except at the driveway area and the utilities area as we have um, existing manholes, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not manholes, um, cleanouts, sewer cleanouts and water meter boxes that we want to preserve. Um, so yes, that's that's our, those are our street improvements um, as well as the I, think, I believe the North Hollis is also focused on a more pedestrian um, scale. Um, so that's why I think the the design of the houses um, satisfy or meet these um, guidelines. Okay. Uh, can you also explain how you meet um, the urban design goals and policies? Because um, that's a different document. Um, I might have to look that into more detail. I'm not sure which policies are we talking about. Yeah, it's just because just the Emeryville design guidelines are a separate document. So, so I, yeah, I think I just want to encourage you um, to include these kinds of details since that conformity with that is part of, part of what we're looking for. Okay, thank you. Chair Thompson, if I could just ask if they could tell us what the uh, measurement between the property line and the garage door is, is uh, just so we all can get a clear understanding. Uh, yes, so, Commissioner Cole. Yeah. Um, so the front setback is set to 13 feet and six inches um, in order to align with the, uh, the two adjacent neighbors. So the front setback is determined by the uh, adjacent properties. Mm -hmm. So we're at 13 and a half feet. Yes. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, are there any other questions? Um, if not, I will move on to the public comment. Um, okay, now is the time for the public comment or public hearing on this item. Anyone who wishes to make comment related to this item should have begun submittal of your online speaker card by now. Um, three minutes will be allowed for the city clerk to read your comments into the record. If you're participating in tonight's meeting via Zoom, please use the raise your hand uh, feature visible on your screen, or if you're calling in, press star nine, and the clerk will call upon you at the appropriate time. Um, at this time, um, Charlie, uh, have any comments been received by the online comment card? Or has anyone raised their hand to make audio comments? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, I do not have any online speaker cards in my email. And, oh, there is one raised hand. I will unmute this person and ask them to go ahead. Oops, wrong one. There we go. Hello. I'm interested to know how the demolition dust and um, and other debris will be mitigated. Thank you. Oh, do you want me to answer that? Raise your hand. Chair Donaldson, would you like the applicant yeah, to yeah, respond? Yes, please, please respond. Uh, yeah, this is Daniel, the owner. Um, I'm actually, we're getting uh, most likely a meter from the city uh, to connect to a fire hydrant to water down any dust. And we're, we're having it, uh, it's basically not safe to go in right now. There's, if you stand in the main floor of the front house and you look up, you can see through the second floor and you can see the sky through the roof, there was a huge fire. And including the back, uh, you can't walk in half the house or you'll fall through the floor. So it's not safe to go in by hand. We, we do have to demolish it with a, a heavy equipment and we are gonna be spraying it with water uh, for any dust to control the dust. Thank you. Are there any additional comments? Uh, Navar has got her hand up, their hand up. 
Thank you. I just wanted to uh, state that uh, the building division reviews all demolition permits, and so there's standards that need to be met, and also the conditions of approval for a project cover demolition requirements for safety. Are there any additional comments or questions? I see no further raised hands. So I'll go double check my email again. Uh, I have no online speaker cards. Okay, thank you. Um, hearing no additional requests to make comments, uh, the public comment portion of this item is now closed. So I'd like to bring this back to um, the commission for deliberation. And Navar, if you can put up the questions that we're supposed to answer, that would be great. Yeah, sure, hold on just a moment. Okay. So, um, yeah, so officially, I mean, I think I have this right, Navar, that you're the, we're asking for the commission's uh, feedback. This is a study session um, on these key questions uh, so the applicant can, can proceed. Um, and I think I will start by calling on Commissioner Mendez, if you would like to comment. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I actually think this is going to be a huge improvement from what's there currently. Um, I do have um, some concerns about the sidewalk. Um, currently, I went out there to just take a really quick walk, and it's pretty much the, the concrete is um, cracked and broken and also the uh, landscape area that's right in front of the house is um, it's pretty much really dry so i would like to see um, more more um, basically attention paid to that area and maybe fixing the sidewalk along with with the property um, and then also um, just as far as the design goes, um, I like the wood. Um, I think it does bring it some warmth, some warmth to to that property and to the area. I do believe that it is consistent with um, with the other houses there. Um, I maybe like for you to maybe reconsider the fence in the front and having the landscape maybe be a little bit more prominent. Um, I just think it would maybe open it up a little bit more. I understand um, the security concerns, but maybe in the renderings, they there seems to be a lot a lot of wood and there's a there's like a abrupt um, stop when you get to the residence instead of it being kind of uh, flowing. A landscape and so maybe I'd like to um, put that out there that you maybe reconsider having the fence in the front um, but other than that I think it's a huge improvement and I'm actually uh, really in support of, of this and I think it also adds uh, more housing to that area not only is it is it it's not just going to be one uh, unit but it's going to be two units and there are three bedrooms so um, I'd really like to see this move forward. Um, but for right now, I think those are all my comments. Um, do you do you have a uh, an answer to the third question there, Mr. Mendez? Oh, um, I don't. Uh, let me see. Does the commission feel that requirements of the plan? I guess I would like to see a little bit more. It's hard to see from the renderings if it's if the landscape is going to be uh, re is, is going to be equal replacement. So I would like to see a little bit more um, detail in what type of trees, what type of landscape is going to be replacing uh, that tree. May, okay. May. 
comments there real quick? Sure, okay. sure, go ahead, Navar. Thank you. So um, in terms of the sidewalk, a uh, full curb gutter sidewalk replacement will be required as part of this project. So that should address some of the concerns there. In terms of the tree, I, um, it's kind of hard to concisely write the question. So to provide some clarity, um, because there's a street tree removal required, there will be um, an arborist report where they assess the value of the tree. And then the question is, will they need to pay for that in addition to replacing the tree? The arborist will be making recommendations as to what types of trees would be appropriate for replacement and rootable soil volumes to go with it to make sure that the tree that's planted is successful. So all of that information will be included. Thank you, Navar, for that clarification. So okay. Trey Thompson, the applicant did have his hand raised, but he took it down. So I'm assuming he doesn't feel a need to clarify any further. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, uh, Commissioner Keller. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks to our staff and the uh, project for uh, their presentation. I, I agree, I like the project overall. Um, I think it's, it's a very good improvement. I remember that place was covered with weeds and the old Volkswagen bug was parked in front of it. And so most anything would be an improvement, but I think this is above and beyond. I like the fact that it is uh, two housing units with three bedrooms. I think that's a real plus for getting any three bedrooms in the uh, Emeryville is really nice. I'd like to hopefully think that these units might be for sale and not rental. Um, I know that is a Part of the question here, but I, I would like to really see that we get people who could be homeowners in Emmerville uh, and still instead of just renters. Um, I am very concerned about the uh, parking garage. I understand the constraints of the lot, but uh, I don't know. I'm a pretty much of a car geek, and I know an Audi A4 is actually a small car, uh, smaller than a Honda Accord. Um, so I can't see a car fitting in that driveway and not uh, impeding on the public right of way. So maybe what you look at is doing a storage space in the back and a carport to where that could be opened and people could park their car. Because if it's a carport, people are more inclined to park their car in it and not use it for storage. So I just, I think we need something bigger than 15 feet between the, the sidewalk. I agree with uh, Commissioner Mendez that I don't know that the fence is necessary um, I think it would be more welcoming and open if it wasn't. And I think a gate where the car goes could just further impede the public right away, especially if that gate swings out. So if you really feel a fence is needed there, I would suggest that the gate for the car park be a sliding gate and not a swinging gate. But I agree that maybe we don't need anything at all. Um, if you go along with the planting uh, scheme that you've shown with the bigger tree in the back corner where the current second unit exists and you plant a sizable tree there and you replace the street tree as required. I don't think that, I think we can waive um, the added fee of the cost of the tree if you're replacing two for one. But even if you just replace the street tree with better, um, better soil, it's gonna grow better for sure. And I think that we also can make the required findings. So that's it for now, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Simons. Hello, um, thank you staff and the applicant for excellent reports. Um, I'm really excited about this project. I think it's great that you're choosing to build two houses rather than one. And like other commissioners have noted that they are three bedroom houses. Um, I like other commissioners, I'm somewhat skeptical of the fence. I think I'd prefer, <clears throat> you know, denser plantings uh, to provide the pri privacy that I think could be provided rather than having <clears throat> another fence like we still see going up in front of so many houses that are newly built in the East Bay um, or in our part of the East Bay. Um, I'm not, yeah, um, I'm pretty comfortable with all the findings and I don't have, I'm happy to waive um, the, the fee uh, that they would be expected to pay as the answer to the third question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Simons. Uh, Commissioner Zepko. I have no further comments. Okay, Vice Chair Young. Um, hi, thank you very much for the presentations. It, it's really good. Um, 
I'm kind of a stickler on street lines, on what happens to the houses adjacent to the property and how they kind of fit to the overall street scale. Um, we have a series of homes that have a feel to the, sh the, the shape and the massings. And I'm not particularly a favorite, I'm not particularly favoring that semi shed roof next to the kind of a boxy shape. If, if this is a study session, definitely take a look at that. I'm also um, kind of that front window uh, just kind of looks like it's just kind of pasted on there. If there's a way to uh, make it more integral as far as like the shape of the building to the to window work with more proportions. There's a lot of opportunity to a lot of shapes and stuff that could still work with the plan and then somehow using edgings and, and massings to then um, fit the shape a little better. I'm sure I'm sure you'll work that out a little bit further. Um, in terms of the overall plan. I like the plan itself. I definitely like that the, the areas between the two massings where it's kind of a shared space. Um, I think it, it it really feeds a great place for for someone to be out there. It'd be kind of an interesting opportunity to make that kind of neat. I know of um, properties in Emeryville that actually do that and they're 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 pretty they're pretty nice. Um, in terms of the outside material and I don't think you necessarily need to stick to although the wood is really nice you know think about uh i mean guess you can look at our 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 whole idea about how how emeryville wants to be in terms of its kind of buildings here and definitely take a look at that because there's some there's some neat things in emeryville and i think uh, this particular design has an opportunity to kind of place those in there um, and get those those kind of overall feels as far as the the, the surface scenes are concerned. Um, in terms of the um, of the floor plans themselves, I think the floor plans are nice. Uh, I I think personally too, the garage is a little little tight, and so so it's a little small garage, but you know it's gonna be nice to just kind of give it six inches on either side and then kind of pull it back like commissioner keller kind of suggested because it is it is tight and um it, what's going to end up happening is someone's going to park there someone's going to drop in, and it's just beyond the sidewalk and it's really what's going to happen um in terms of the um sorry i have to use my glasses here but sorry. um in terms of the um Oh, in terms of hitting all the findings, I, um, I, I, I think it's wonderful. I think the fact that you are in fact bringing um, some more units into um, Emeryville, uh, I, I, I like the idea that it would be a sold unit. I definitely like the idea that maybe um, the working the three bedrooms in there with both units is really fantastic. And I think we see, need to see more of that. Um, in terms of how the, tre how the trees would be the trade-off I would I would be completely support supportive and making sure that if the arborist does make a selection on the kind of trees to replace the circumferences or the drip lines of the different kinds of trees that are be be taken out that you know there's a there's a proportion that has to be brought back if not better. Um, I would like to see um, some when you do draw this the second time around um, really try to show the street up and down the block, just really with the trees in place and how it's really going to look. And those are my comments. So thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Okay, great. Um, and Commissioner Schaaf is, uh, is uh, recused, so I will finish this up. Um, yeah, I did want to thank the applicant um, for the presentation and staff um, for the thoroughness of the, of the staff report. Um, I do, this is a study session. Um, and so um, in terms of the overall design of the project, I think I would echo many of the things my fellow commissioners noted um, about the, the level of detail and the, and the um, looking, looking at the massing, looking at the contextual quality of the other um, buildings and some of the construction or some of the, the details of the building itself, um, looking carefully at the the screen and whether whether it could be vegetation versus versus a um, a fence. Um, I did want to encourage the applicant though to really dig into um, the the documents that we're supposed to judge the design by. So in terms of really presenting the North Hollis uh, Urban Design Program, um, really looking into the general plan and the urban design goals and demonstrating how it's consistent with that. 
um, would really be helpful for us. And since this is a study session, there are more, more opportunities to do that. Um, the Emeryville Design Guidelines, they have a lot of information about um, sustainability um, and other approaches. Um, and they, they often ask for, for detail that isn't immediately obvious that you need this early in the process. So I would encourage you to also look at that in detail um, and, and so that we can have a, a very robust conversation about that. Um, but in terms of the, the program, um, it being two homes, um, you know, in a, in a residential, consistent with a residential fabric, um, the massing, you know, pretty pretty uh, straightforward, and the and the three bedroom homes. Um, I think I also agree with my fellow commissioners that that's a positive thing for Emeryville. So um, so look forward to you developing it further. Um, so to the second question about whether the findings can be made, I think I don't have enough information at this time. Um, so I look forward to more information. Um, and then the question about the planting of the replacement tree um, and whether the uh, cost should be waived. Um, I, at this point, I'm not inclined to waive it, um, but I would look at the arborist report um, and try and make uh, a, another consideration when all the information is in. Um, so those are my key comments. Are there any other final comments from other commissioners? Um, okay, well, with that, um, I think we've uh, come to the end of this agenda item and I'd like to move on to the next one. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I guess the only question is, are there any questions from the applicant? They feel like they've gotten every all the information they need. <laughs> I just demoted yeah. the applicant to the panel. Uh, there's still a couple of applicant representatives left. I don't have any more questions to you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Thank you. And then Charlie, this is the mechanics of getting Commissioner Chafe back. Oh, right. Should, I need, should I we need. should we take a pause? Uh, that'd probably be a good idea. Maybe have two or three minutes. Okay. Three three minutes. Be back here. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. At seven twenty.
Because we're missing Commissioner Keller. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to um, agenda item 7.2, uh, 7400 San Pablo mixed use project. Uh, and then if we can have the staff presentation at this time. Yeah, uh, good, good evening, Commission. I'm going to share my uh, screen here. Okay. All right, so this is the first study session on a new project uh, located at 4700 San Pablo. And this is the location. Uh, it fronts San Pablo uh, along 47th and 48th Street. Uh, across the street from San Pablo is the ECC, ECCL, and there's another school, EBI, to the south of it. Uh, this kind of gives you uh, the two existing buildings that are there. There's a two-story building fronting 47th Street, and, and it has an adjacent parking lot, and there is a single-story building uh, along 48th Street, which also has a parking lot. Uh, these is uh, uh, photographs along San Pablo Avenue. This is along 47th Street. The blue building is the EBI. And this is along 48th Street. This is sort of the parcel, the three parcels that constitute the project site to give you an idea uh, of the configuration of the block on which it sits. So like I mentioned, the parcel size is 1.24 acre and there are two uh, existing buildings that will be demolished. Uh, the two-story building is currently occupied by hy hydraulic controls. And the one-story building along 48th Street has a mix of tenants, which includes studios, gym, and a car stereo shop. All these tenants are on a month-to-month -month lease at the moment. The proposal is to, uh, as I mentioned, demolish the two buildings and uh, construct a new four-story, 54-foot tall uh, research and development building, or uh, known as life science or lab buildings, and this will be 63,000 square feet. In addition to that, uh, the proposal includes uh, nine residential units. Uh, there will be five loft-type units facing 48th, 48th Street and each unit is about 1,300 square feet, and there will be four three-bedroom townhouse units along 47th Street, and each unit is about 2,800 square feet. So this shows uh, the site plan. You have San Pablo on, on your uh, left, and, uh, and then you, and the circulation in terms of how the building will be accessed will be both along 48th Street and 47th Street. Along San Pablo is the commercial building. Uh, the space on the ground floor fronting will be supporting the office and lab uses in terms of lobby and other amenity space. And they're also proposing a community room, which is about a little under a thousand square feet. Uh, like I had mentioned, there are uh, townhome units along its eastern uh, property line, as well as five loft units uh, along, uh, along 48th Street. Uh, the setback along uh, on uh, between this residential building and the easternmost property line is 16 feet here, and it is about 14 feet uh, here. This is level two. Uh, so level two includes mainly uh, parking in the commercial building, and levels three and four uh, are uh, the lab and uh, office buildings. There's also a roof garden amenity that is for uh, the tenants of the lab office building. 
This kind of gives you the section showing that the life science building which is 54 foot high and this is along San Pablo Avenue and both the loft uh, residential building and uh, the townhomes, uh, townhomes building do not exceed 22 feet as you can see. And this kind of shows you the massing, uh, the building massing, San Pablo is right here. And as you can see, uh, the building height uh, steps down as it moves uh, along uh, uh, eastwards. Uh, at this time, there are certain fundamental issues that the applicant is seeking uh, input from the commission. And so they have not uh, spent too much time uh, regarding the actual design and the skin uh, and the uh, building skin. So in terms of what are the different issues on this site, uh, let's look at the general plan land use. It has uh, three general plan designations. Uh, what you see in this thick red line is the project site. And as you can see, you ha it's, it has mixed use uh, with residential and the other the, is medium density residential. The hatched, more hatched, uh, area that you see that indicates that this that area is neighborhood retail overlay. Then if you look at the zoning map and the zoning overlay map, again, what you see in red here is uh, the project site. And you can see that uh, the zoning, the site is split into two zoning districts, uh, uh, which is MUR and RM. And it has two uh, zoning overlays. One is uh, neighborhood retail and which is indicated in yellow and then the hatch marks are for PPP which is pedestrian priority overlay zone. So in terms of the use itself, the base zones, uh, as I mentioned, are mixed use with residential, which allows a variety of uses, including residential uses that include office and uh, R&D. Uh, the medium density residential, the RM uh, district allows residential uses, uh, and this is the easternmost parcel. In terms of the overlay zone, uh, you have the neighborhood retail, which uh, outlines uh, uses on its ground floor, and the zone allows art galleries, small community assembly facilities, uh, restaurants, personal services, and small retail stores. And by small, it's 5,000 square feet or less. And these uses are allowed by right if they occur on ground floor and, uh, and, and that they are local serving and that they are less than 5,000 square feet and have hours of operation not exceeding uh, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. And if these uses do not um, uh, comply in terms of local serving and hours of operation, then these uses may be allowed with a conditional use permit. The and our overlay zone also allows additional uses with a use permit. And these include things like pet stores, bars, uh, gaming activities, uh, bigger retail stores, liquor sales, food and beverage sales. Uh, so what is being proposed in terms of uses is on the ground floor includes uh, a little under a thousand square feet of community room and a large lobby amenity space for the commercial uh, building and the remainder of the parking uh, remainder of the uh, commercial building is occupied with parking and loading. The upper flows include parking, research and development and office uses uh, which are permitted in the MUR zone. Uh, MUR zone also stipulates that development on sites between one and five uh, acres require a mix of uses where at least one use is residential. And the proposal includes the five residential units along the 48th street. In addition, there are four townhome units uh, along 47th street, but they sit entirely on a parcel that is uh, on the RM zone. Now, in terms of uh, the height, the FAR and the density, the, the, the site is again split uh, in terms of uh, the heights and FARs and the density that are permitted. And uh, your staff report contains this table which kind of breaks down parcel by parcel how uh, the site uh, is zoned and uh, what the general plan uh, designations are. But Simply put, uh, what you see, so this is the site in yellow, right? And this is the red line. Now, this line, any everything below it or west of it is in the higher height 
FAR and density uh, categories. And those are written here. So these are the first numbers are the higher uh, height for FAR and density. And these apply on the area below the red line. Above the red line are the areas which uh, fall uh, under lower height, lower FAR and lower density. So when you have uh, our zoning regulations allow and gives direction when sites are, have such split zones, and it essentially states that the development should conform to the height FAR density zone on which they are located, except that the higher zoning uh, districts, that is the height FAR density may apply if these following conditions are met. One is that at least 50% of the site area is covered by the higher zoning districts, that is the height FAR uh, and density, and that the entire lot uh, could be included to the higher districts by shifting the district boundary line by not more than 50 feet. In this particular case, the proposal does not meet the second criteria, and therefore we cannot uh, uh, have a one height FAR uh, uh, designation for the entire site. So what that means is that the proposed building must comply with the height and FAR in which they are located on the lot on which they are located. And when you and as designed currently, the proposal does not comply with the height and FAR. So it will need to either be redesigned or will need a general plan amendment and rezoning such that the entire site falls within the mixed use with residential uh, and within the higher height and FAR uh, uh, districts. So th th really the crux of what we are talking about is again, this is this uh, the line that splits uh, different districts. And what you see in this blue area that is hatched, this is the portion that is, does not comply with the FAR and the height. And this is about uh, 11,500 square feet of uh, office lab space. And it's the height is 54 feet and, and this should be 30 feet. So this is the portion of the pro proposal this, that will require or requires general plan amendment and rezoning. In terms of parking, uh, commercial vehicular parking, uh, they are within what is permitted uh, by our code. And in terms of residential parking, they also comply with that. Uh, other things like open space, sidewalk widths, design, all that is very conceptual at this point. And what the applicant is seeking direction is essentially on the journal plan amendment. Uh, in terms of staff comments, uh, the, pro the staff felt that the project massing and the varying heights was well thought out and that adequate setbacks were being maintained along the eastern property lines. Uh, and that the project provides a different type of housing stock in form of townhomes and loft style units. As you know, a lot of our uh, housing stock is uh, multi, multi uh, family uh, units on over a podium. Uh, it was noted that the sidewalk width along the three street frontages were not shown at this time and would need to comply with the 12 foot sidewalks uh, to be consistent with the pedestrian priority overlay zone. So in terms of the questions that uh, staff and applicant is seeking is of course, in terms of the users, does the commission find uh, the mix of life science and residential users uh, appropriate for the site, uh, given uh, that uh, it is in the neighborhood retail overlay that outlines certain uses on the ground floor along uh, San Pablo Avenue, what uses does the commission feel would be appropriate? And then of course the main, uh, issue is does the commission uh, support a general plan amendment in rezoning uh, to allow increased height and FAR for the commercial building as proposed or should the applicant redesign the proposal uh, to meet the existing standards for height and FAR. I did not get into the bonus points calculations at this point, uh, but essentially if the project as designed and if the general plan amendment is uh, approved, 
then it would need uh, about 96 bonus points. And so at, the, at this very early stage, uh, we would like to ask the commission that in that scenario where uh, this proposal needs bonus points, whether the commission have any suggestions of how uh, the applicant could obtain them. So that concludes my presentation. The applicant does have a presentation uh, for you, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions uh, before that. Thank you, Maru. Um, I'd like to, at this time to ask the commissioners if there are any questions for staff. I have uh, one and I don't know if it's gonna be easy to answer that. So Maru, if you could go back where you show the building height where it crosses the red line or the zoning districts. I just have a- This one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so from the red line east on the part of the building that exceeds the height limit, how much of that is 50 feet? Because if it only goes 50 feet into that area, we would not have a problem, correct? Correct. So yes, so if you can see my, this is the portion right. that is wow. 54 feet, but this, the height is 30 feet. Yes, Charlie. Mate, you, you, the, under the planning regulations, in order to move that red line at all, you have to be able to encompass the entire site uh, within the higher district by moving the line no more than 50 feet. Okay, so, so what I'm trying to say is- You can't just we, move it within the site like 30 feet or something, that's not allowed. No, what I'm trying to do is figure out how much of the building would be left over if we move that project line 50 feet east, how oh. much of that building would be left over outside of that zone? And if what I'm getting at is if we do move that line, can the remainder part of the building that exceeds that be moved to the um, northwest where that gap is or yeah right it will go up and they go over right, on this, right. well no, the other side of the red line I, yeah. you mean on this side i'm yeah, sorry but we, perhaps i'm not being clear but you can't move the line 50 feet right but it but the the height extension can go 50 feet the line and, has to stay where it is Right, but they can go 50 feet beyond that in their height. No, the line okay. has to stay where it is. The, the only scenario in which the line can be moved is if you can move, if you can encompass the entire development site within the higher district by moving the line no more than 50 feet. Okay, and even that, that doesn't exceed the height. Even, so all of that. Right, to, if you okay. can't move it, by you know if it if you can't get the whole site within that higher district by moving the line 50 feet or less then you can't move the line at all got it okay that answers that question thanks mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay uh any additional questions i have one um all right maru can you clarify what uh it could be in life science um, in totality, I want, you know, I want to get a sense, is this more an office? Can this be a lab? Like, what are all the different kinds of things that could be in here? So what they are proposing is what's research and development, right? And so research and development would include lab space and the associated office space. So typically most uh, research and development, be it whether we call it life science or biotech, uh, that's how they, some, they split up in terms of how much is actually lab and how much is actually office. Uh, and, and what is being proposed here is, is a lab building, which will have office component to it. Okay, and I just, I wondered if we had uh, any concerns about lab space adjacent to housing. Has, has that been expressed? Uh, this was reviewed by our fire marshal uh, and he did not express any concerns regarding, uh, regarding that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so at this time, if there are no additional questions, um, I'd like to invite the applicant to make a presentation. I have a quick question. Oh, sorry, content. Commissioner um, Mendes. Just kind of piggybacking off of your question about the labs, is there any, um, if they're allowed to be labs, is there any restrictions as far as if it's a chemistry lab or a biology lab? No, no. Uh, research and development will include uh, it does not differentiate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Vice Chair Young. Um, Maru, is I mean, is there any um, 
questions in terms of sound and noise abatements or any kind of issues that have to do with like constant hummings and stuff like that? Were there any regulations on that in terms of a lab in that well, area? Uh, they all lab, all buildings, uh, all users, including lab users, have to comply with our noise standards. So typically, uh, what happens uh, with these R and D buildings is that the noise emission that comes from the rooftop equipment that is the main source where the noise emits, and that is typically mitigated through screens. And they need to demonstrate to us that it complies with the applicable DVAs at the building permit stage. So the, so the situation by having residential units actually that close to these buildings, you'd have to find a, a, a proof of mitigating that, that noise then, is that the yes. idea? Yes, and that would be the case for any R&D building, no okay. matter the location. It's just the what is the noise level uh, that they need to comply with that changes a little bit. Well, I think in this particular case, it's, you're, you're, you're introducing a mixed use that I find a little unusual. So I just thought maybe it might be something that needs to be really thought of in a different manner. Okay, so right. Vice Chair Young, I'll, I'll stop you because these are questions. Uh, is that the conclusion of your questions? It is. Okay, so Commissioner Chafe raised your hand. Yeah, I have a related question, which is that for this type of building use, often you, there's a large generator associated with the project. At what point in the review process would that come up and would that be reviewed? I'm just wondering if there's a, like an earlier stage where the size of space, like the, the space allocated to something like a diesel generator would need to be considered. So may I share my screen and show you uh, something real fast? Oops. So if you see, this is where the rooftop equipment will reside, including any generators. And this is the screen that I was talking about. So this is where all, uh, you know, uh, equipment that is necessary for a lab, especially lab buildings to function is this is where it would be located. Isn't that standard? Is that standard practice that generators that, would be located on the roof? It, not necessarily, but uh, uh, we have seen that in R&D buildings, they tend to be there. Uh, they can also be included inside uh, the build, uh, inside the commercial building. Uh, so if, for example, in the Sherwin-Williams, the existing building 131, uh, in that particular, which is under construction, which is under building permit review, they are they will be locating it inside the building. So it varies. So right now, you know, they have not identified uh, where the generators will go, but it is but they have identified uh, the rooftops. So that is something uh, for the commission to note, including with this uh, this additional height is the screen of the rooftop, and that reaches seventy uh, feet, and that is permitted by our regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Maru. Um, any additional questions? Okay, then I'd like to invite the applicant to make uh, their presentation at this time. All right, I am promoting the applicants to the panel. All right, there you go. Whoever is making the presentation can share your screen. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Fantastic. Charlie, thank you for promoting me. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, uh, and just one quick question because I can't see John. Uh, John Simodi, are you on as well? Yes. He, uh, okay, I'm great. On, Rob. Yep. I'm here. Uh, okay. You. Okay. Perfect. Um, one quick question, uh, Charlie, and you might be in control of this. Uh, it may be helpful for me to have access to annotations so I can draw and point to things. Is that something that you can, you can give me permission your, to do? You can share your screen and anything that you sh can do on your computer screen should show up. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Let me, um, you can try. Let me go through and share. I'm going to share a couple of things here. Uh, 
It's going to take me just one second. This one, uh, this one, and this one. Okay. So let's see here. Okay, I'm I'm scrolling through uh, a PDF right now. Is is what you all see on the screen in my Adobe Viewer? We see, yeah. Okay, yeah. fantastic. This is great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be here tonight to talk to you about this. May I ask uh, Maru if I have a time limit or anything? I just want to be res respectful of everybody's time here. So outside of as well, quickly as possible, do I have am I on the clock? That's up to the chair. We typically don't time applicants, but we ask them to okay. be succinct. Okay. Yeah, we'll, succinct we'll, is we'll, good. Will do. Uh, I'll start by saying uh, I work all over the Bay Area, almost almost without exception, urban infill projects like this. So I'm often in front of uh, folks like yourself to give up your time to be on commission. So I know it's a labor of love and public service. So I thank you for what you do. Uh, it, it's not easy and I appreciate it. Um, so Maru has done a great job of showing uh, lots of characteristics of the building. I do wanna add a few things to be able to help at least give you uh, a value system about what we're thinking about the design and the urban design uh, piece of this. Uh, I would like to be able to answer a couple of questions that came up by commissioners too, uh, particularly related to the generator and to mechanical equipment and, and things like that, because I can shed some light on that. Uh, but but this really does come down to a kind of a fundamental question. And, 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 I, and, I, hope, and I hope what John and I showed to you tonight is uh, a compelling case. We'd like to keep going on this, but I think it will take uh, a philosophical agreement that it's worth doing something that's out of the ordinary. I will say that I'm not normally in a conversation about asking for general plan amendments. That's somewhat unusual. So it's with all due respect. So um, let me just run through this if I can. Um, I, we're here to talk about, um, and I, uh, Commissioner Young called, noticed it was an unusual mix of uses, which is true. And, and given and given this is a life science project and his his uh, his background was the Salk Institute, which is probably the greatest science building of all time. I'm somewhat you know humbled to be talking about life science on the screen today. It's no Salk Institute, but we're gonna do our best. Um, just to lay the land here real fast, um, and I'm gonna go ahead and point on some things here. So this is a site 48th to the top of the screen, 47th to the bottom, high school across San Pablo, es uh, Escuela Bilingue across 47th. Um, the bulk of the commercial building is here in an L-shaped pattern. We have the attached townhomes here. We have the four townhomes are uh, here. So these are loft, I wanna correct that. Um, this is the rooftop amenity and this is the mid block crossing. Okay, so just so everybody's bearing straight. Um, next, um, this is a quick aerial Maru has shown you, I think that the the first organizing element for me is the idea of how this project transitions, right? Because we are in a transition zone. Mixed use uh, zoning is um, my favorite. We've done a number of projects where we mash up uses of different kinds and they're often in, in a neighborhood setting like this. And we have to be very sensitive to how the buildings work with the context that they're in. This is a very, very interesting project in the time that we're in and the location that this is in related to being located next to the high school and to Escuela Bilingue. Um, after being in a pandemic for a year, the light is shining brightly on science and why it's important to all of us. And this is a, a building that's all about that. And so the fact that it's at the confluence of an educational uh, kind of heart of the city and has a chance to participate in a, a a momentum and interest in STEM uh, is, 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 is interesting. It's, it's actually, a, I was really excited when, when John brought this to me for that reason. Um, the second piece of this that I think is fascinating is how it transitions to the neighborhood and the moves one needs to make and, and, and how you can use that mix of uses to help create that transition. And that's what this is trying to do, uh, organizing the lower scale, oh, um, sorry here. I meant to draw with my pen. Um, organizing the lower scale residential offering here to be able to create an edge along the streets, but also create a mid block crossing that's unique. And then this allows the whole project to scale from its 
westerly position towards San Pablo down. That's an important, um, you know, kind of organizing principle for us. And where this comes from for me is many of you probably know this building, Emory Crossings. Um, I had five great years uh, running our company in that building. It's a shame that it just, it, it, the way that building is sort of cordoned off, we weren't able to grow the way that we needed to in there. So we did relocate um, about a year and a half ago to downtown Oakland. But the five years in this building gave me daily walks, almost daily walks to Berkeley Bowl for lunch um, and other places, but mostly Berkeley Bowl, uh, walking down the Greenway. And I passed by these townhomes uh, at city limits um, that Cobb did a number of years ago. And I just always love these. I, I love how they defined and worked with the Greenway and how they created a certain level of activity. Uh, people actually did come in and out of there all the time around lunchtime. Um, and, and, it, and they're across the street from, you know, a, in, in its current use, a more in, industrial building on that side. And the space is so pleasant and the residential experience is so pleasant. And so this off the street, public accessible, uh, let's say miniaturized greenway through the middle of the block, I think helps create a really interesting dialogue that we've actually been able to do a few times successfully. That could be a really interesting organizing principle for this project. Um, and you can kind of begin to see that here just so that you can all sort of appreciate the the scope of this, if this is all of the resident, I'm sorry, not the residential, but the, the landscape component of this, this is about 6,000 square feet of public throughway that frames stoop entries into all of these units along here, you know, just creating a nice sort of off the beaten path, a very pleasant arrival and landing spot into the units themselves, but also, you know, just a really nice uh, buffer between where the building uh, stops and where the building starts. Uh, as as Maru said, we're organizing our, our commercial facing uses here along San Pablo, holding the corners on both sides, um, using the program to screen the parking. Okay, I'm gonna clear this and move to the next slide. Um, and I'll just, I'll skip through a few slides. One one of the things that I'll, I'll say here, and, and, and I did do, this is a really fascinating conversation around the split zone and where that line is drawn and how it works and, and the philosophical intent it's intended to create, because it's, that's really the crux of what this discussion tonight is going to be about is, is, are, are, is there a way to look at this philosophically as meeting the intent of what's trying to be done, knowing that the, the sort of technical application of the, the maps and the standards need to be tweaked a little bit to, to make that happen. So I think that's really the, the focus of, of what we'd like to get some feedback from you on. What what I will say is is that as Maru and I have been talking about this over the last several days, and and her staff report, of course, is is great and technically awesome. Um, I did go back through and do some measurements, and and I, I, it's gonna it's gonna come out in the wash sooner or later. But in the end, Maru, I I do actually think that the use on this side from an FAR perspective of that 120 foot line. I think we're a little over that 1.6 FAR on that portion of the site only. So I, I think it's actually a two-part problem to talk about tonight. It's both it's both the FAR on this portion of the site, but also the height on this portion of the site. I've got some diagrams I'll show you in a few slides that sort of frame this, but it, it really is a, a, a somewhat nuanced and complex ge geometric problem to solve. Um, uh, the section you've seen, we, we tried to do this on both sides of the street to try to create, as you move in easterly into the neighborhoods, create uh, variation and step back in the massing to sort of respond to that transition of the grain uh, along 47th and 48th away from San Pablo. And um, uh, these are four of my projects. They are very similar to this, all three stories. Um, three of the four of these are mixed use buildings. Uh, sorry, two of the four of these are mixed use building. The bottom uh, two actually have housing as part of an office use. Uh, the upper two are, are only office. Um, they are uh, built in other cities, but what they do is they provide, I think a little bit of window in our soul about where we'll be able to take the architecture. Uh, if we all agree, it's a good idea to go that far. 
um, I'm a pretty strong believer in having really quality sidewalks, which by the way, what's drawn from the face of the building to back a curb on our site plan is 15 feet in a row. So I think that, you know, we have some way to operate to get a quality sidewalk there. I, I'm a I'm a big believer in having as much transparency as possible and where you have to have, uh, you know, some, some, some closed spaces. In this case, this is a building in Palo Alto that's got parking behind there. Uh, beautiful green uh, living wall, which is different than vines because the living wall can be installed day one and look beautiful like this. And we all don't have to wait for it to look good. It looks good right away. Um, those elements, you know, combined with, you know, real uh, statements of entry and porousness visually are, are really important to me. Um, I do think that all of these three story buildings share an idea about, you know, kind of a compressed version of space middle top. I think it's really important to be able to sort of think of the upper level of a building and give it a little bit of a, of, uh, of a, I mean, a statement, but just acknowledge that creating some variegation up the facade can add some interest and scale to, uh, to the building. And I think that's really critical. Um, and all three of these buildings, why they, they all look a little bit different. There are some common elements around massing, materiality, how we modulate the length of, of buildings that, you know, are the kinds of, of um, you know, that's the kind of thinking we would bring uh, to this project ultimately too. Um, these are views of, of, of all of these uh, projects. Um, this, uh, this one on the upper right actually is the backside of uh, the Visa building I did in Palo Alto. This actually faces a public park. The idea that the, that the park would be, you know, somehow or another raised up by fact that it had, you know, stoops and front doors and visibility that matched what the other housing in the neighborhood was doing on all sides. The one on the bottom right is a project in Menlo Park where we have something almost exactly to what I'm proposing here, where we have the commercial building on the right, we have some uh, some townhomes over flats in this case, so three stories, the so scale wise pretty similar to what we would have there off of 48th. And, uh, you know, a beautiful uh, courtyard here that's actually really pleasant. And um, it's a transient space. It's a, it's a, you know, it's not intended to linger a ton, but it's just a gracious and, and, and nicely softened front door uh, to the units themselves, but also just a nice little buffer to, um, to the office building uh, transitioning to residential. So Maru, uh, I think I probably should apologize that this is the first time you're seeing this. I actually just did this today because my mind has been spinning as we've been talking this week about how to characterize the problem because it really is a little bit of a game of Tetris actually in order to be able to meet the FAR goals on what effectively is two parcels, but the parcels don't really run east west in a real way. They actually run kind of north south because of the impact of the split zoning line. So what you see here, and I just want to just touch base to establish what the scope of what we're talking about here is because I think it's important. Um, this sort of transparent blue line that you see is the zoning height envelope. So this is the portion, this is our 120 foot line and I'm just gonna go ahead and draw it here so it's pretty clear to everybody. This is our 120 foot line, okay? It calls and that's 35 feet as you head east. Um, this 45 degree angle line is called for in the code. Uh, so you're supposed to transition as you get to that 120 feet. So this does step up at 45 degrees to where we get to. 55 feet. So what you see here um, is a pretty clear indicator of what we're talking about, uh, which is we've created a compliance scheme um, here, everybody that tries to honor the FAR. I'm, I'm going to call it on the front half of the site. So from San Pablo to the 120 foot line uh, that meets FAR and it meets height. So what you see is, is that we still have two levels above the parking um, uh, structure and then we have the at grade components um, the same as before uh, but there's two noticeable difference that portion that extends along 48 is only one story to be able to get underneath the 35 feet and it's only one story because I have to eliminate a level of the garage in order to be able to get that to compress down to be able to you know solve the height constraint the, FA, the other thing that happens is the FAR constraint on the front half of the site, and I'll just go ahead and highlight that here. Some of you may have picked up on it, is, is that I actually can't, with, with the width that I need for a proper lab building to have the proper depths and lab planning modules and servicing that goes along with them, 
I can't build along the entire length of San Pablo and comply with 1.6 FAR in that portion of the site. So it actually becomes truncated. And I, and I think the thing that's, you know, somewhat interesting about it is, is that you can say, well, all right, that could be some kind of publicly accessible open space. That's true. Um, I don't know that I, I love that it doesn't hold the corner here. Um, urbanistically, I wonder if, if, open space in another location would be better if there's a way that we put a little more money into emphasizing what that experience would be like uh feels like a win uh, but that is but that is an impact and you start to see here and i've highlighted it in red just so that we understand it if if you look at the two parcels the two mur parcels and you apply the 1.6 on uh the portion of the properties that can be that and the 1.0 on the on the easterly portions, it can be that. And those, are, we are in full awareness that these are bonus level FARs. We understand that these are not base level FARs. Um, you can get a maximum area, 60,582 feet, which is on blended if you aggregate these parcels. And I'm leaving the RM parcel out of this, by the way. We can talk about that if you're curious. Uh, um, Chair, Chair Thompson, if that is, uh, if, yes. if it's okay with you, I would just like to interject something, if I may. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Because I believe there may be a bit of a misunderstanding about the FAR constraint. I, I think it may not be as severe as the applicant may believe it is. Uh, let me just read a provision from the zoning regulations about FAR. This is concerning split zoning. So uh, if you can't move the line, which in this case we can't do, then the code says the maximum permissible floor area for the lot shall be calculated based on the floor area ratios that apply to each portion of the lot. However, the resulting floor area may be located anywhere on the lot, subject ah. to applicable height limits, setbacks, and any other dimensional requirements for each portion of the lot. So you would multiply the front portion of the lot by 1.6 and multiply the rest of the lot by 1.0 and add those two together, that's the total floor area for the entire project. And you can put that anywhere on the parcel, anywhere on the project site, a subject gotcha. for height limits. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, no, that makes great sense. So that, that Charlie, thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, sure. That's that's very helpful. And so that, honestly, what that, what that does is that it, we look at what's on the right-hand side of the screen here um, and this goes back to uh, Commissioner Keller's question about, you know, that portion that exceeds the height is there's is what's the flexibility there? That really becomes the crux of the conversation, actually. Um, it, it really does, because you can see that uh, if we go back, um, I just want to go back a couple of slides because it, it demonstrates this. Maru showed you this earlier. Um, we, we work together to put this together to try to demonstrate this. So really then if we can't apply this anywhere within that, that one, that 1 1.6 zone um, that Charlie mentioned at that 120 foot line, then we really are talking about approximately 11,000, you know, 500 square feet in round numbers that is really represented, I think pretty graphically clearly in this. And, and what's actually very interesting and, I'm nerding out as an architect here a little bit, but I've got a few architects on this call, so you'll understand what I'm I'm talking about. If you look at if you look at that height limit at 35 feet, you'll notice that the third floor line starts just above there. Just correction and there. Correction. That is 30 yes. feet. 30 feet. Uh, not 35. Is it not a? Okay. But so you're talking about the lower the lower district. Yeah. Lower is that not a thir Is that not a 35? No, it's 30. Okay. Okay. Um, so squarely, thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Um, mm -hmm. So pretty, pretty close to that, but I can't, I can't squeeze those floors anymore to get that last bit under there to turn that 11,472 square feet into half of that because the parking structure needs to work. And then the height of the lab floors in order to be able to have adequate um, interstitial space for mechanical servicing just won't won't allow me to sandwich that so that's where those two floors come in so really what's what's pretty interesting here and if we go to this one on the screen if you can see me zipping around at sketch up here 
you can see what fits underneath the envelope. Um, there's a lot of it that fits. There's a lot of room under there. Um, and so really what we're, what we're talking about is in order for the, the project to, I think, function the best as the building that it's trying to be, I, I think that the critical, critical question really comes down to is the, is the way that we've sort of thought about the site, the massing, the use, the fact that this use is located in an educational heart here in that intersection, there, there could be a great exchange uh, at the ground floor about how we can try to capitalize on that proximity in a, in a cool way. Um, and that the housing is accretive to the conversation and the mid block crossing that defines some activation with the stoop entries as something that I think could be pretty nice and pretty pleasant in that neighborhood. It, is it is it is it meeting the intent and the spirit of what the code and from a technical standpoint is intending to provide? I, I feel like that's really that's really kind of the crux of the matter. And that and that's you know trying to trying to do my best to present to you that what the value systems about urban design and architecture are. These are things we believe in really strongly and want to do really well. Um, but I think to make this work as a development, and I think. And John can add some color to this if you're interested too. Just the you know the you know the the need from a development standpoint as a project sponsor about what the you know how the building can function as a as a proper investment and and, and real estate deal, and 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 still create multiple wins for everybody is really is really what the issue is here. So that's all that's all I have to say. I hope that's been helpful. I do want to respond to the question about the mechanical systems, if I may, because. Um, uh, Maru's correct. Yep, we, we there are two there are two s solutions for that. One is on the roof. One is in in the ground. In either instance, that need to be vented through the roof. Um, and the thing that you have to pay attention to very specifically in these life science focused buildings is uh, re entrainment of exhaust air because the lab spaces are 100% outside air uh, supplied. So you have to be very cautious about where you exhaust because you don't want that to come back into what feeds the lab. So we make decisions based on location on the roof or indoors relative to how the rest of the mechanical solutions design, but that's the primary gating um, uh, force in making that decision one way or the other. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I wanna uh, see if commissioners have any questions on the applicant's presentation at this time. Uh, Commissioner Keller. Finding a, a mute button sometimes is a challenge. A couple questions. Um, you you did you talked about the cut through uh, by the um, townhouses and lots. So those are going to be twenty four seven open public access all the time. Uh, in my heart of hearts, it would be twenty four seven public open access all the time. Yes. Okay. And then um, you guys didn't mention or talk about, <clears throat> but it's something that's going to have to be addressed, or and you may already have. You just haven't sp spoke of it. But on the forty eighth Street side towards the far eastern end, there are a lot of beautiful, healthy redwood trees. Those are planned to stay within the project? Uh, I'm gonna have to say that that's something we'll study. We do have a nice setback there um, on purpose for that uh -huh. reason. Um, we, we would never want to take down or nor would we be allowed to, I would assume to take that's down the heritage yeah. tree of that stature. So, Hundred percent, we would design around that, and and okay. and ultimately look at that as a benefit in the landscape design. Um, it definitely would, would be. Do. Yeah, it definitely would be, and I can almost guarantee you, with what happened for the biomed building and all the trees, that the removal of the trees they were thinking almost killed that project. And these trees are far healthier, they're far more beautiful. So you need to look at keeping those in the project if you want to not have a lot of difficulty. <laughs> so yeah, I, you just haven't mentioned them and I walked over there yesterday and I thought, well, these things are major. So I just wanna make sure you guys were aware of them and you were uh, addressed it. So that's all I have for now, thanks. Uh, any additional questions from Commissioner Chief? Thank you, uh, the presentation was really helpful. Um, I saw that there's a community room that was tentatively drawn in and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the intended purpose of that or what you'd envision it looking like. Well, uh, yeah, no, I'd love to. Uh, the, uh, 
I'm doing uh, a, a project with a mechanical engineering consultant um, who is in a, a, a women in STEM group with a friend of mine that works at Bayer. And it, it got me thinking a little bit about, you know, just the, the you know, just the, the time period we're in and the ability to be able to harness some energy around what science gives us all. And it's really sort of saved our bacon, let's be real. So, and there's tons of equity in the markets to invest in these kinds of projects. So time is now, and this location is so great because there's schools on both sides. It, it, what would be great? And I, I can't, can't give you a, an exact answer at the minute. We haven't found the right working group, but that thousand foot is a perfectly sized classroom. I can fit, I can fit 30 people in there in a lecture scenario. I can fit 15 to 20 in a seminar. That would be like a great location that in a perfect world, if the company that's in there or uh, vendors that are affiliated with whatever kind of science goes on there welcomes in how you can use that as an interface with the schools on both sides of the street. That, I, I mean, there's details to work out there obviously, but the intent, and it doesn't even have to be just the thousand square feet that's there. It just, it's nice that it's on the corner. It, it's safely traversed by crosswalks. So it just feels like a nice spot for it. And it's a decent size for it. So that's really the goal is to use the development of the project as a way to interface with the kids that are learning this stuff now real time and, and think about blossoming careers in this direction. That's the goal. Thank you. Um, and then for the rooftop garden or um, terrace, is that intended to be a privately owned public open space or restricted access to people who are working in the building? Yeah, we're going to think about that as uh, an amenity for who's working in the building and that the mid block movement through and the landscape there being the kind of public offering as part of that. Okay, great. And then two more questions. Um, the residential units, apologies if I missed this, but are those intended to be leased or owned? Is that something you've talked about? So um, I, I think that the, the, and John, jump in here uh, when you want to as well. The way we think about the RM parcel with the four towns, and the reason why those towns are three stories and they're sort of a, a little bit larger on that is, is that, you know, like we've all been working home for a year and like, you know, having a place where you can work and have a home above that feels like it's in vogue again. So, you know, in the, in the truest spirit of live work, not the kind of idea that co-opted South of market is a, as a, as an idea to maximize real estate, just having a spot down there at grade would, would be the right move. Those would vary likely be for sale units, I would think, because they're, it's a it's a nice discrete parcel. Um, they're sort of standalone. They're only attached to each other. They're not integrated. The lofts, um, on the on the other hand, that back up against um, the, the the commercial building and on the edges of the parking structure, um, probably more likely that those are part of, uh, those are probably managed as rentals as opposed to for sale, just because of the way the condominium maps would have to be drawn it, it, it just, it, it just might make it a little weird, um, to own in the long term. So those would likely be uh, apartments, but I think in the end, we're probably going to be reflexive to the market, um, about what makes the most sense, but uh, it does, it does appeal to have some of those as, as ownership opportunities. Great. Okay. And then can you just talk a little bit about your thinking on the parking? So right now, um, I think we saw like, or, my impression is there were two different um, numbers for the parking that you showed and what we saw in the staff report was a fairly large number of parking spaces. Are you um, thinking about potentially reducing the number of parking spaces to deal with some of the issues that we're grappling with right now? Or yeah, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about how the parking fits in. Um, well, that no, let me just, I'm, if it's okay, if I'll just bring this up because it does uh, list what the stall counts are. So, and, and again, this is a, a conversation about uh, height that goes into this too. It's a con it's also a conversation about stalls that are being provided. So, you know, what's, what's really interesting is that, you know, the, this deal doesn't work with subterranean parking. It, it, this is not an aggregated, it, it's a modest size project from, from that standpoint. And so, we, we do need to figure out ways to work above grade. So you, you pretty much have an ability to park at grade on one level or two levels. And it really is just a question of, of how much you get out of it. So one, one level gets you about one per thousand and two levels gets you about 
two per thousand, right? And and what's on the right, by the way, is what's in the staff report. So, um, I, I, you know, John is going to probably be able to opine on this a little bit, but there there is a little bit, and and again, I was in Emory Crossings for five years, and a bunch of my people who commuted from other parts took Emory to go around to get to the office on a, on a daily basis. So, you know, there is plenty of of, of transit opportunities. Um, I think that the market, and when I say the market, I mean across a, a, a wide swath, there there does appear to be evidence that in the science-related fields, they're, they're 10, this is somewhat because of the, the off hours that are worked and s- safety concerns with being on public transit and off hours and so forth, that um, having a little more parking is a little better for this uh, demographic. Um, mm-hmm as opposed to a little less, it's, it is a little less transit rich than some other locations. So I think that there's a, a balancing act about how little we can provide to be good stewards of the environment, encouraging public transit and decreasing auto trips, which go hand in hand, obviously. And then having a product that maybe doesn't measure up to, to what it's competing with too. So that's, that's a little bit of the gamble. And I don't know, I don't know, John, if, if I answered that in a way that you agree with, but I think, it's it's a complex question, but I, I think that it probably makes more sense to be closer to the 2.0 per thousand for this location, um, based on all the input we're getting um, from from the brokerage world about this. So, but you know, op- open to open to talk about this for sure. I think Rob, you you answer that you answer that perfectly. All, all the leasing brokers we talk to that represent the companies that want to end up in Emeryville. Uh, 2.0 per thousand seems like the, the absolute minimum that, that they can tolerate. And it's it's a blend between what, what the city is, is prescribing, which is a, a blend between what's a, a, a typical office use and a lab use. So with the 50-50 blend that we're, we're applying here, that the 2.0 per thousand is what comes out. And, um, and I'll, I'll tell you, even, even that number, most tenants you talk to, most leasing brokers you talk to, you know, they'll, they'll scratch their head and say, gosh, is there any way you can get more? And, and understanding that, that Emeryville wants to limit the amount of parking, which is which is a great thing, uh, it, it, it becomes a marketability issue at some point. I, we don't want to lose tenants to this location. Number one, it's, it's already a, a slightly less main and main location. We don't want to lose this tenant and they end up in, in say, Oakland or, or, or further down to Hayward or Alameda, for example, that, that doesn't have these restrictions. Is that the last question, Commissioner Chay? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Mendez, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I had a question. Um, I know this is really early stages of design, which is actually a really great uh, time to start thinking about implementing some sustainable uh, design features on the, on the project. And considering that an R&D building does have high energy demands, um, have you thought about that? Is there any plans? to implement um, solar panels. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Um, it It's pretty tough on a compressed footprint like this with the MVP systems that we have to accommodate uh, for much solar, unless we actually roofed over and created a mechanical penthouse, which would effectively make the building a lot taller. Um, that, that would be tough. Um, we could certainly get the fresh air requirements we would need to do that, but th- it would take a leap of faith to let us put a roof over that in order to have more roof for solar panels. Um, there's one thing there. Uh, I, I, I do think that uh, as a value system of, of my company, and I know that this is shared by John, uh, we don't we don't do anything that's 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 anything less than lead silver. Most everything we do is lead gold, lead platinum. We, we mostly are in a world now where everything that we're working on is going to be well certified in, in other parts of the Bay Area if that well is an important piece of it. So there's a, a part of sustainability that is both the energy usage question, but it's also the, the environmental health and uh, physical well-being. So things like ample bike parking, um, um, accessible showers by the bike parking to be able to encourage bike ridership is a big deal in the projects that we work on and we have space to do that here um all of these features goes in with um the the very real 
understanding that we have south and west exposure on the two main facades of this building. So part of the reasons why I showed you the examples of the projects we've done at this scale before is we had to, we had to solve those same problems. So there is actually some architectural um, interest, I think, that comes out of this about a response a responsive attitude to sustainability that can enrich in the aesthetic character of the building too, but also make it work. Um, I, I, you know, we, we for sure share uh, what the spirit of your question is there um, and would look to get the highest levels that we can in terms of certifi- in terms of certification and, and just a sustainable value system. Great, thank you. Hey, are there any additional commissioner questions? I have a question. Um, thank you. Um, so can you talk, so obviously this part of this project is, you know, has a neighborhood retail overlay. And as far as I can tell, this project doesn't include any neighborhood retail. Um, can you talk about why you decided to do that? And if there are any opportunities to make that happen? I know we've, there's actually successful neighborhood retail uh, in this neighborhood already. There's successful neighborhood retail on this site right now. Um, and I know we're about to spend a ton of time and money making San Pablo a much more pleasant street to walk yeah. along. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, gr- great question. Uh, if I may, let me just pull up that first floor plan, uh, just because I think it kind of shows the scope. So uh, let's go here. There we go. Um, so there's a certain amount of the frontage here that we're just, it's kind of, kind of compul- we're offering the community room as what we think is a benefit. We do need some space for loading. Uh, there is a, about five or so thousand square feet of space here. Um, I think that the intent uh, is to create a, a create a space where the f- let's call it the forward facing, visually appealing uh, cafes, congregative eating, breakout spaces that that kind of stuff that when you look through glass has uh, a compelling. Uh, activity to it, which is which is nice. I think that's where our head is at to keep the the focus visibly on what's happening in this building. A um, little bit like broadcasting what's happening inside to outside helps kind of concretize what this what this project is about. That said, um, there's enough room in here, I, I, I believe, to to think about a sort of small r- retail usage um, that we could maybe do both with there. I, you know, I think John can chime in here too. I think we would we would want to be a little reflexive with what the market is. I mean, obviously, coming out of COVID, retail is a little bit of a challenging asset class at the minute, and we all hope and pray it recovers. I can't wait to go out to dinner every night in a, in a few weeks when everything's open and we're not wearing masks anymore. It's going to be amazing. Um, you know, maybe that's a feature in this too. Maybe there's a little bit of a rebound effect. But I, you know, we would we would love it if we had a an active. Um, beautiful storefront that was all about this building and looked really great and contributed to the public realm, but you know maybe wasn't retail that was empty from time to time. If 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 we're still kind of taking a while to get out of out of COVID, maybe you know maybe there's some flexibility about trying to find tenants, and if we can't, you know maybe there's uh, some ability to go both directions to be reflexive to the market. But John, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I would I would echo some of your comments on just the, the current state of the market. So we at Orchard Partners we own a, a project in the South Bay that has some some inline retail there, and uh, we spent three and a half million dollars building the space out. It looks tremendous, and and thank goodness we had the the I don't want to say foresight, but we've got a, a large patio out there that's really helped these businesses survive. Um, they, they've been on, on payment plans for the last, I don't even know how long it's been, but but effectively all year. So we've been trying to support those businesses as much as we can. Fortunately, it's a small enough amount of our total holdings down there that, that it's it's not necessarily a profit center. So we can be a little bit um, a little bit more, more helpful there. But right now, just brick and mortar retail is is really hard to, to make sense of. And, um, and to add to that, and I think Rob pointed out earlier that we just got a really small f- footprint here to work with. And you know, every square foot here, it, it really counts. And I thought if we can dedicate that to a, a space that is frankly just a little bit more of a, of a confluence with what's going on directly across the street with the two schools, we thought that would just be a more beneficial and, and frankly cooler use than, than just having another Starbucks in there or something like that. And, and the other reality is, and I haven't talked to, to too many retail brokers on, on this particular location, 
And Henry, I, I do agree with you that there is a, a lot of, of retail that's that's not too far from the site, but what we've got is kind of a, a mid-block site here with not really much across the street aside from, again, these schools, and you've got a, 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 tra a train yard or, or a bus yard, a uh, caddy corner from us. It, it's going to be a very tough sell, I think, to, to bring in a, a retail tenant, at least the way things look today. But uh, it, we, we, we do remain, we could be flexible on that in the future for sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other commissioner questions? I have a couple, but I want to make sure everyone else has gotten their questions answered. Um, okay. So uh, I wanted to just ask Rob uh, if you can talk a little bit about the loading and how you would see the facade there. Um, just because yeah, I know it's a little tight and the loading is on the front. What, what's your thinking? Uh, yeah. Let me let me pull that up. It's a great question. Um, so the loading is so, so what's drawn here uh just so you know is a 55 foot semi truck uh, this is the absolute worst case scenario the the primary vehicle that's going to come in and out of here on a daily basis is a box truck um what we wanted to show here is what happens if um as opposed to what happens all the time and and actually when you overlay the turning radiuses um you you really don't have any choice except to use 47th street as your option because it's the rightest it's the widest physical space from curb to curb san pablo of course is not the ideal spot for that because of the traffic on it but also the median just sort of makes it impossible to come around so uh, that being said uh it is possible to move the truck further down 47th to get that spot a little further away it's true uh, it does create a little bit of a servicing challenge, um, which is something that we can work around. It's kind of nice to be able to co-locate vertical circulation to the extent that you can. Um, but uh, we also want to, you know, not, not not drive as any more east than we have to. And and I will admit that your question for sure is one that requires further study. So let me, um, in terms of what it looks like, um, we would be. Uh, it's a little bit of a mashup of, of things here. I think a lot of what we would see, in my opinion, along 48th um, is, is sort of what we're doing here. Now, whether that's articulated panels that are architectural, my preference would be a living wall. Um, we would be isolating that moment where you're, you, you've got the need to move service in and out in a way that you could kind of hide it in the length of that facade in a way you're using it when you need to, but it's not like it's open all the time. Um, and so trying to, trying to minimize it as much as possible, but just be, you know, just be, uh, you know, uh, recognizing that it's kind of a spot that it's, it's best to happen for the layout of the building. And it seems to work as well as it can urbanistically. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, and my second question was, um, I asked the question earlier about life science and compatibility with housing. Um, now I'm going to ask the question about life science and the compatibility with schools. Are there any concerns? Um, no, I mean, this, uh, so uh, it's most of the tenants that are, are in the market in life science are BSL two or, or better. Uh, so that's, um, biosafety level two. So these are, uh, they, these could be anything from computational dry labs uh, to um, cell therapy and gene therapy. These are these are not. You know, this is not a biosafety level three where you're studying virology. That's not what this building is. So um, they're certainly not an office building, but they're they're not a lot more than an office building in a wide swath of the potential tenancy. So I, I, we wouldn't. Um, mm we wouldn't be entertaining nor nor would you allow us to probably get a use a, a use permit for a tenant that did things that were a little too noxious right um particularly given its locations but but there's a, a very wide swath of tenancy that would would work just fine here okay thank you um okay well i will uh if that if that concludes questions no further questions oh wait vice chair young do you have a question you're on mute yeah, I, I realize um, that 
Maru brought something up that in terms of the skins and stuff on the building, but like, what can you just kind of talk a little bit of, are these buildings are going to be between the residential and the lab? Are they going to be the same kind of architecture or are it's going to be, a, how do you see it as a, a mismatch of two different styles that are going together with each other or are they contiguous to the neighborhood? What do you kind of think in a sense? Um, so I'm, I'm a big believer in uh, context edges and and i don't mean philosophical context i mean sort of physical context i mean i kind of mean philosophical context too but um i i tend to find that um like this example on the right is is it, what you can't see in the frame is is that there's housing that's two stories over a half up half down podium literally on three sides of of this park the whole move to create an architecture uh, solution to how to integrate a mixed use element into this office building uh, was all about scale. It was all about grain. It was all about the differentiation between what is the commercial building and what's the residential realm um, and what benefits the open space piece of it. So if we go back to this other side and remember what's on the upper right and also even think a little bit about what's on the lower right, what's on the upper right looks this way as it relates to the public realm and what's on what was on the lower right looks this way as it relates to the public realm so i believe pretty strongly you want to personalize those responses and those edges because they help define space they help define the grain the, the residential buildings will feel residential um they they should feel residential um and and, and conversely both are both are made stronger when they feel a little different so the the the, the life science building, I think we'll, we'll have some fun conversations about, you know, what is the material quality of that? What does make sense? There's actually, there's, there's, there's some nice, I call it an industrial esque, you know, vibe, even, even EBI sort of has like a, a kind of a cool rehab sort of flair to it. You know, and there's a bunch of buildings like this in every build that could work sure. its way into this. But I, I would want to assure you that from my standpoint, we wouldn't be designing something that was, intended to look the same all over the place because they're solving different spatial uh, and architectural problems. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, all right, I'm going to move on to the public comment portion of the meeting. Um, thank you. This is where Charlie's demoting me, I think, right? <laughs> No, not yeah. yet. Not thank yet. You, oh, yeah, great. Not, not yet. Thank you. The, but thank you for your presentation. Um, okay, officially. Now this is the time for public comment on this item. Anyone who wishes to make um, a comment related to this item should have begun the middle of the online speaker card by now. Three minutes will be allowed for the city clerk to read your comments into the record. If you're participating in tonight's meeting via Zoom, please use the raise your hand feature visible on your screen. Or if you're calling in, press, press star nine and the clerk will call at you at the appropriate time. Um, at this time, Charlie, um, have there been any comments received by the online comment card um, or has anyone raised their hand to make audio comments? I do not have any online comment cards and I do not see any raised hands among the attendees. However, I do want to note for the commission that you earlier this week should have received two emails, uh, one from Jonathan Singh and one from Greg Rosemarynowski or something like that, uh, both about this item. Uh, I believe that was sent to all of the commissioners. Those two comments were sent to all of the commissioners. I also neglected to mention when we were talking about 1270 64th Street, uh, item 7.1, that one of those emails also made comments on that project as well. So you have those two comment letters. Other than that, I see no comments among the attendees or online speaker cards. Okay, great. Thank you, Charlie. Um, hearing no additional requests to make comments, um, the public comment portion of this item is now closed. Um, okay, now I'd like to bring this back to the commission for deliberation. Um, this is a study session. Um, and I think uh, we do have a set of questions and maybe uh, Maru, you could bring those up so we focus on giving the applicant the right answers or answering the right questions. Um, and why don't I uh, start with uh, Commissioner Simons? Sure, let me just take a look at these questions here. Uh, 
Um, so I think I'd have to say I don't think the mix of life science and vegetable uses is an appropriate use of, or I guess you know I've, I don't I guess I don't have a huge problem with life science. Um, life science building here, and I'm happy to see the residential going in. Um, I, it's, I'm pretty disappointed not to see the neighborhood retail. Um, I think this is a place where hopefully we can make it work. Um, but I think just um, in general, I think I'd rather see a lot more housing here um, on a lot less, a lot fewer offices. Um, okay, I'm reading question two. Um, I think the applicant should redesign the proposal to meet the existing standards for height and floor area ratio. Um, and then I think it's, I think just more generally, I think it's just like way too early in the process to even start talking about bonus points. I'd love to see a proposed design that falls within zoning standards for height and floor area ratio. And then I think we could start talking about things like bonus points. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Simons. Uh, Commissioner Mendez. Thank you, Chair Thompson, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I myself do R&D buildings, so I was very excited to be able to comment on one of these projects because I typically have to recuse myself. Um, but as far as the mix um, of life science, residential use, um, I think in general, I'm very supportive of like mixed use. Um, you know, I think it really helps activate the neighborhood and activate the street and um, could also bring some kind of a sense of community because um, it gives people, um, you know, a reason to be connected to an area. They, they work there, they live there. And so having this mixed use, I think um, is a really good, um, and, and I'm in and, and support of that. Now, that being said, this is something that's like a little odd. I don't think we have something like this in Emeryville where it's residential, lab, office, and then also retail. It's kind of throwing everything all in one, one site, which could actually be a good, if done right and done respectful to the residents, I think it can be a very interesting mix and um, maybe we'll set a new president in, in Emeryville. So I really do encourage you to um, study that very carefully and just make sure that you are respectful of the, the residents around there. Um, as far as the FAR, um, I don't think I have an issue with the added FAR. Um, it's, not, it's not too obtrusive, it, it fits in and uh, with the overall building scale. Um, so I don't think I have an issue there with, with the added FAR. Um, and then as far as the bonus points, uh, just like Commissioner Simon uh, said, it's a little bit early to start talking about bonus points. We would like to see it a little bit more developed. Um, I also wanted to uh, bring up the issue of parking. I know that's not one of the, the uh, comments here, or the questions, but I would really like to see um, maybe uh, reconsidering the 2.0 um, and having it be less parking. Um, just in general, just to kind of give you a, a few facts, it's a seven minute walk from 40th Street. And on 40th Street, you have Emory go around. You have the F line, which comes from the city. You have the 36 uh, AC Transit, which connects you to Berkeley. You have the 57, which connects you to BART. Um, you also have right in front of this building, you have the 72, 72M, and the 802, which connects Richmond, San Pablo, Cerrito, all the way down to Oakland. And then right across the street, we also have the Bay Wheels share um, bikes that uh, that you know are we encourage people in Emeryville to to use them. And so I think maybe uh, reconsidering the number of parking spaces um, should be should be thought, and maybe even giving a little bit more to to retail or to um, 
to the community space. Um, I'd like to see that. Um, let's see, what else do I have here on my notes? Um, oh, I would also like uh, for you, or I would like to encourage you to consider allowing that uh, outdoor um, roof garden to be a private, well, public space. Um, I just think, uh, for example, there's the Emory Station and the Emory Station West, where they are, they're public, or I should say they're private plazas, but there's public access through there. And for myself, I cross um, over and I use Emory Station West, I would say almost daily um, to get across the tracks. and. For me, that's kind of one of my more pleasant uh, moments in my walk, just um, going up those stairs and going through that that courtyard. So I would like to maybe um, encourage you to reconsider that and having it be uh, access through the public uh, street also. Um, and I think that is all for my comments. Yep, that's it for right now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Mendez. Um, Commissioner Keller? Thank you very much. Uh, good presentation, guys. I, I really do like the project. Um, I'm gonna try to address a, a few of the things here. So a question for staff um, that I didn't think about earlier was, we're doing housing with this project um, and it does take bonus points. So, does the requirement that 50% of the bonus points come from affordable housing apply to this project? Because that's one of the requirements we have that when bonus points are required and there's housing, there has 50% of the points have to come from affordable housing. Does that apply here? I believe that only applies to projects that are more than 10 units or more. Okay, okay, that's what I was thinking. And they've got nine, so I was wondering if that maybe gave them the reason to do the night. Okay. So uh, quickly, I just, I have, I did walk the site yesterday. Um, I think this is appropriate. I think the additional FAR is such a small portion of this project that it is really not going to impact the neighborhood because it's on the side that has the schoolyard um, and there's really no housing directly across from this portion. And I think it's what makes the project work. And I think being probably one of the people that were involved in the general plan at the time, I kind of understand that we were trying to delineate neighborhood portions and business portions. And since the initiation of the general plan, our world has really changed. And I think the thing that makes Emeryville successful and always had made Emeryville successful is our ability to pivot when we know that we need to pivot. So I think looking at a general plan amendment for this is totally appropriate and I think it's necessary. Um, like, uh, another advantage I have is I work with lab buildings. Um, so just let me address a couple of things is um, Vice Chair uh, Young lives across the street from a lab building. Let's not forget all of the Warren buildings that are over there are lab buildings. They're the exact same thing that we're talking about here. And in that building, there is a cafe. So we have, I mean, the building is not connected, but we have this example in town. And right uh, north of my building is all, Bay Center is all lab buildings. They're, they're getting the whole center building right now to make in labs. So this isn't unique to Emeryville that we have housing and lab buildings in close proximity. It's all over town. And then the fact that our labs near schools, UC Berkeley is nothing but labs scattered all over the campus with classrooms and everything else. So this, although this is a unique concept and where we're putting it and how we're putting housing together, which I really commend the architects and the, the uh, developer for. This is perfect. This is perfect for the neighborhood. If you look at the buildings in that neighborhood, this is definitely going to begin to upscale that neighborhood. And it's providing nine houses that don't exist there currently. So I think everything about this, and I think looking at the buildings in Palo Alto and Redwood City that Brick has done, this is the type of developer we want here. Um, and this is a person who knows our community, who lived and worked in our community. So I really think that he has his pulse on what we need and he has the pulse on what will work. 
Um, I think, you know, the parking is under the required or what, what is allowed for the city. They're one of the first projects that have come to us for biotech or life sciences that have not asked for more than what our city standards are. I do think that they could get some um, bonus points if they do drop their parking a little bit. And Rob, as you're saying, um, you have a lot of people working late at night, but late at night is not when your parking demand is at its peak. So I don't think at you know nine o'clock at night you're going to need the you know the amount of parking that you have in that building. Half your people will not be there. So I think as a sign of a good faith and to maybe make your project move a little smoother, kind of see if you can't reduce it, do something else with with that space would be my recommendation. So I feel it's definitely an appropriate building and appropriate use um, for the. Uh, I, I understand the retail. I really understand that very well um, with what's going on uh, in today's market. I would like to see some ground floor retail, but for me, it's more important to have what I call ground floor active space. It doesn't necessarily need to be retail, but if it's something different than what's in the upper part of the building, and if it interfaces with the community, like I think this classroom can with the with both the schools that are there, I think that's a real asset, and I think that covers uh, what we need it to do. So I. The, the use is appropriate. I support a general plan amendment. And um, for bonus points, I think if we don't need to do the affordable housing, I think if the fact that they do some of them for sale, again, I think that could be a bonus. And there's a segment on um, 47th Street, I believe, that has a transform, has a couple utility poles and a transformer. So maybe we could look at undergrounding those utilities that front the property. So those would be my suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Keller. Um, Commissioner Zepko. Great presentation, guys. Um, so far, I really like this project, and I agree with several of the other commissioners in terms of really enjoying like the mix of use. Um, one comment I would say, generally, I do agree with the proposed use, but just given how like we're recovering from COVID, like I'm not as confident about office space in general. Um, and as somebody who, you know, is maybe biased a little bit towards affordable housing, um, personally, I would love the, I know that you're already adding nine additional units into an area that doesn't have it. So I, I think that that's great, but especially given that concern about office space being used generally. And then, um, I think another, I think it might've been Commissioner Mendez that had described the parking or how, how accessible it already is. Um, maybe potentially using less of the space for parking and maybe also considering that towards affordable housing, that's maybe just my slant on it. But generally I think that the proposed use is strong. Um, agree that in terms of the amendment and the rezoning, it doesn't seem like a significant enough issue um, to block the amendment. So I support that. Bonus points, I think it's still pretty early on as well. So I don't really have a lot of commentary there. Overall, I would say I'm really excited to see um, see more from this project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Zipko. Commissioner Chi? Thanks so much for the presentation. It was really helpful and um, great to see some of the um, designs in 3D, um, at least on our screen. Um, so to the questions, proposed uses, um, just one really detailed question, because I work in air quality. Um, there was a comment about making sure that any generator exhaust wouldn't be re-entrained into the building itself through um, you know, outdoor air being pulled in and um, just in this conjunction of um, residential and office space, I wonder if there are any concerns about the residents being exposed to generator exhaust um, because the wind usually blows from west to east. Um, very detailed, but something to consider. Um, just in general, I, I so far I haven't heard anything that makes me think, no, we definitely shouldn't do life sciences and housing so close together. I will mention that I've heard comments from people in the community in Emeryville who are skeptical about some of the life science R&D that's coming in, especially, you know, there's so much of it right now and wondering what exactly is going inside the, going on inside those buildings. So I would just caution you that, you know, if this project does move forward, you'll probably want to be really clear in your communication with the community um, and with stakeholders, especially in the community nearby, um, to be as specific as possible about potential risks um, to avoid pushback. Um, I support uh, Commissioner Zepko and Commissioner Simon's comments about maximizing housing on the site. I think because it is so well linked into transit and because the schools are so close by, it is a really special place to add 
new housing. And so I very much appreciate all the housing that's proposed. I do hope that many of the units can be um, uh, owned rather than leased in the end. Um, but if there's any way to maximize it even more and add a few more units, that would be wonderful. In terms of the um, neighborhood retail, there's something that always sticks with me. When I first moved to Emeryville about seven years ago, someone said, oh, you're gonna be close to San Pablo. It's so cool because there's so many independent small businesses along that street. And I think that's really true. And so I would really push you to try and consider how to bring in at least a few business spaces there. I know it's really tentative right now in terms of the progress going forward. Um, one anecdote, there's a cafe up San Pablo a little bit that's near a school. And I've seen a lot of people before and after school using that cafe area as a meeting place, taking their kids there as soon as they get out. So I do think that there could be some real benefits to having another um, cafe or food space located close to the schools. Um, I would also encourage you going forward to get uh, feedback from the schools about the proposal for a community room, um, because I know that ECCL across the street was designed to have a lot of lab space and sort of, you know, flexible um, rooms within it. So maybe that they already have that space available um, and they would prefer programs to come to them. I don't know, but it's just something to, uh, to ask about going forward. Um, one last thing on the sort of use of space along San Pablo, definitely support having wide sidewalks there. I think it's not just an issue of meeting standards for Emeryville, but also um, pedestrian safety. It's a really challenging area for pedestrians, a lot of car traffic already. And so the wider the sidewalks, the better for expanding the range of uses of the, um, the ground level space. Um, in terms of the general plan amendment and rezoning, I think so far, um, I am not convinced that the amount of parking is appropriate. I think that there's a strong case for reducing it for the reasons that Commissioner Mendez laid out. We also received two public comments, as Charlie had mentioned, and both of them suggested pretty strongly considering less parking. Um, so it would be really hard for me to support an amendment right now without being convinced that the parking is appropriate. Um, I think that it should be reduced. Um, let's see. Anything else? And then bonus points, again, pretty early for the discussion. Um, I sit on the Parks and Rec Committee for the city as well. And so I'll just say that we're having a lot of discussions about how to maximize park space and get new open space within the city, especially given the need for distancing over the past year and people really starting to appreciate and ask for more park space within the city. Um, the southern part of the city and the eastern part of the city tend to have less park space than other parts. So anything that can be done to move towards creating more open spaces or shared spaces for the community be, would be really appreciated. Um, and then I think um, just one more thing about the, um, the location. Um, I mean, I think that public transit there is someone on this call characterized public transit as like so-so, or that's what I took away from it. And I think um, Commissioner Mendez laid out that it's probably one of the most connected places in our community for getting to work via other means um, that do doesn't need parking. And so um, I'd really ask you to consider that and look carefully into the different means. I mean, you can have Amtrak coming from far away. It's really easy to take a bike share over to the building. Um, so many local options for coming from BART as well. Um, and so, you know, if you just kind of consider somebody coming in from a, a variety of distances away, then I think that there are options for them to do that. Um, so anything that the bonus points could do to increase uh, public transit accessibility and to reduce car traffic along San Pablo, especially near schools, would be very much appreciated. And that is the end of my comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Chief. Uh, Charlie? Chair sure, Thompson, yes. I'd just like to clarify one uh, thing in respect to a comment that Ms. Commissioner Chase said concerning the rezoning and general plan amendment and the parking. Um, the parking does not count as floor area. Uh, so floor area includes everything except parking and loading. So uh, min uh, reducing the amount of parking will not affect the FAR because parking is not included in FAR. It would to the extent that making the building smaller would affect the height, it would affect the height limit, but reducing parking will have no effect on FAR. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, and I was going more for the height aspect, but thanks very much for clarifying that. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Vice Chair Young, do you have comments? Oh, um, great presentation, you guys, and I too must uh, concur the fact that the 3D graphics that were included is very, very neat and very, very helpful. Um, 
So in, ter in terms of the appropriateness of having a lab and a residential and a retail put together, it's kind of like reminds me of like you get great chocolate and peanut butter going together. And I think it's a I think it's a really interesting and I think it really adds to something the city hasn't seen and I think a lot of places that haven't seen. So in some ways, we might, I, I, I kind of sense what um, Commissioner Keller was mentioning that, yes, uh, we do have residences next to labs, but there was also a lot of issues that were going on with those. That did include the humming of noise and all that other stuff. So there was a long, long issue with that. And a lot of these units that were very close to those got those every day. So as long as that you can find um, valid ways to mitigate that, that's, that's fantastic. Um, I, also was a little concerned about like before your presentation in terms of how life sciences, I mean, I mean, we got to be a little naive to believe that there's no emergencies involved in life sciences. I, I, I know that in the areas around where I'm at, they, they do occasionally happen. So um, as, as long as that's also thought of in some way, I understand that it, it's probably more office oriented as opposed to really lab oriented, but again, to get a better understanding on how that works. Um, I'm completely uh, find it just floored and wonderful to find that 15 foot wide street space in the front of the building. I think it will be a, a wonderful example for other buildings that are would try to do something similar to that adjacent to this property. I'm not um, completely opposed to dealing with the height limit issues that uh, were brought up in the original, I mean, the original constraints. And I think your proposal does meet that very nice. Um, I would like you to kind of think about uh, how the, you know, this is still a study session. You're still trying to block these spaces out um, and whether you have a, uh, a, a walkway go from, you know, zigzag, or the way you're having a zigzag through there, it's going to come to a little, but, but think of nodes that would be really special that people can kind of really use in there. We have a lot of really neat places throughout Emeryville that, that use these nodes and um, have a kind of a pattern that we started here. And I think there's something that could be really wonderful. Um, I, I, the Salk Institute is one of my favorite buildings in the world. That's a that is an homage to a to a person who I think understands a, a full sense of human scale and hu human sense, and still was able to bring a sense of commercial and a large technical technological edge. Uh, I, I think that's a that's a message here, and I think it's something that needs to be brought. I think you guys um, do a very nice job in possibly making that a a, a real uh, fruition. Um, uh, let's see, before I saw the presentation, I was a little bit, um, skeptical about, um, this whole idea about this retail and this massive amount of retail and the restaurant and the art gallery and all this other stuff. And, um, there, there are situations in where, where people who have, who just don't have the means of, you know, massive businesses. And I'm really glad that you met, used, you know, Starbucks as the example and nothing against Starbucks, but that we think about the middle ground and you are across the street from a high school. So the possibility of inspiring um, um, young business entrepreneurs to find something that's relatively, uh, uh, you know, give them an opportunity that they wouldn't have otherwise, I think it's a neat thing. And I think that that particular area does very well on that. Um, so I, 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 I spoke of the uh, rezoning. There's something really interesting about the units themselves. Um, you're mentioning, so so there was something I read about the the lofts being three bedrooms and one, I know, I know there's a count in there somewhere. Um, I think it's great. I think it's a good mix. Uh, definitely keep that in mind. Um, in terms of bonus points, these are really important to me. I think there's, uh, I, I think if, if you could use a bonus point, my, maybe, um, having to do something that might be inspiring to the school, some kind of relationship to them, maybe offering, you know, maybe there's, there's a, there's a special classroom set up that, uh, a, a lab in there might actually be really great as an active lab and maybe there's something ongoing for those students to be able to partake in that since it is just across the street 
and um, do something really positive for them, I think is really nice. And um, that there is also a truly a strong interaction with the neighborhood. You are placing a rather large, interesting, and like I used before, a kind of an odd bird of um, placing this in this kind of neighborhood. I mean, you've got all these neighbors around it. I mean, would it be a bonus point to maybe have them sign off on something like this and uh, including us and including um, the staff in that sense. Um, in terms of meeting the parking needs and stuff, uh, it's, 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 it's a call. Uh, I think the way the, the massing is set up now, and, and if you feel the parking is there, I, I, I also have an issue with a lot of extra traffic being dropped in there, and I wish we could use a little bit more of the public transportation as we're doing. I think if you have an opportunity to bump up the, the number of units from nine and just go ahead and um, kind of put the stiff upper lip and go for the 50% bonus points on maybe getting a couple more units in there, I think it'd be worth it, you know, if the, depending on how you're pulling that off. Um, just make sure I would just make sure that each of the unit does have one space or at least most of them do um, in terms of in terms of the uh, overall feel of the uh, amount of material or like you know so you have a lot of delivery and you have a lot of supplies constantly going in and out of this building because you're you know you have a lab there so um, so if there's a way to make sure that it doesn't impede either the residents around there or those that are living on the site itself, I think it's a good thing. So those are basically my comments. And I want to thank you very, very much for making a, a really fun and wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair Young. Um, yeah, I also want to thank the applicant um, for the good presentation. Um, to This is a study session, so to give you some uh, feedback relative to the questions. Um, I, I think the life science and residential uses are appropriate for the site. Um, you are in between a very major corridor, San Pablo Ave, um, and a residential neighborhood. And it's actually uh, nice to be able to shield the housing a bit this way um, and to provide a diversity of uses. Um, also, the neighborhood retail overlay, I agree with Commissioner Keller um, that it's really important that the ground floor is active. Um, retail is great, but there are many other uses that could be active and contribute to the street life um, and to the activity uh, of the neighborhood in, in, uh, in at large. Um, so I think it is appropriate. Um, in terms of the general plan amendment and rezoning, um, I do support the rezoning. I, I don't find the four um, stories out of scale, um, particularly given the, the um, activity on San Pablo itself. Um, it does have to be developed and, and thought out, um, but it seems fairly, fairly reasonable for the neighborhood and the location. Um, so I think also, again, uh, a couple other points that other commissioners have pointed out is uh, the question around parking. This is a highly served area, but it is served by buses. It is not served by train. Um, so it is transit rich, but it's buses, um, except for the link to Amtrak. Um, and there are people who do walk to, to, um, to MacArthur as well. So that shouldn't be forgotten. Um, but but that last mile um, or the quality and service of the buses, you know, become the concerns about how to adequately service um, the 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 site. Um, but anything you can do to reduce um, car trips, car traffic, uh, I think in general uh, the community would support wholeheartedly. Um, so do look very carefully at parking, um, and do look at alternative modes um, and that last mile. That will be really critical. Um, the one other thing I'd give you just a heads up on is that the design guidelines are important to look at in detail. There's a lot of information in those. Um, a lot of it uh, pertains to an, a sustainability approach, um, and we will be looking for that uh, in later later meetings. Um, I, I think I agree with everyone that the bonus points are a little early, um, so I'd like to encourage you, you to see what uh, options there are consistent with the vision of, of your development. Um, as it develops. Um, so those are my comments. Are there any final comments from commissioners? Every once in a while, there's a last comment that comes up or a question. <clears throat> yeah, I have one. 
Would you call on me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, Maru, if you could go back to the uh, client's um, slides and probably close to the lab, maybe even the last one, it's page eight on theirs, on their deck. What I want to do is talk about the interface with the parking structure and the uh, the housing units. And one thing that we have in Emeryville is we don't like automobile cars like shining right into units and we actually like to block the visibility of the cars from the parking garage. So if you'll <clears throat> did you want garage, so did ahead. you want to see my deck or did you say uh, the applicant's deck? Well, it's in both the applicant and, and ours. It's in our uh, staff report. I think it's maybe the last page, second to the last page of the staff report. Not the, the visuals, not the actual write up. Go down. So proceed 14, 15, keep going down, 16, 17. You're going the wrong way. You're still going the wrong way, Maru. I, I to the end of the deck. I don't have, I think you're thinking uh, of the applicant's deck. Well, in our packet, we had drawings, the same yeah. drawings right. the applicant had. Yeah, Mira yeah. didn't have our, the drawing. All the drawings. Oh, okay. okay. Do you want me to pull something up? Yeah, I just. Yeah, maybe, Rob, <laughs> if you can, share your sure. screen. Uh, here we go. Um, yeah, go down to page eight. Go ahead and tell me page eight. Eight. Right there. Okay, so uh, bottom right corner, you see how the mm -hmm. units look right in that parking garage. We don't want to see that. Yeah. So uh, what? what it's, so this is a, no good point. We wouldn't want that either. This is actually <laughs> this is actually sort of a tricky image. You're seeing those columns, but that's actually office space that's glass floor to ceiling. Okay. Um, but <laughs> but agree with you 100. And, and and it's worth commenting that we we like the idea from a safety standpoint and an access and convenience standpoint that the residential parking was along that edge so you could go straight out you know from from the garage onto the uh onto the greenway but agree with you wholeheartedly that we would have a, a partial high wall at a minimum to be able to deal with the comings and goings there you're you're 100 right yeah and, and if we can enclose it somehow artistically or something so that they're just not looking into an ugly concrete structure would be nice sure yeah, it was my only other comment. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank thank you very much. Um, yeah, again, I just want to make sure that the applicant uh, has gotten the information they need. This is a study session. Um, do you, you feel as though you've gotten gotten what you need out of this? Uh, I you know I think this has been great. It's it was with some level of trepidation that we didn't have more worked out. That's generally what we do in sessions like this. But I think that the big big picture items that we needed feedback on to take the next step we got. I feel really, really uh, knowledgeable about what to do, especially with Charlie correcting me uh, on a, a number of issues. So uh, yeah, no, this has been great. I really appreciate everybody's time. It's been a, a really good discussion for us. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna move on to um, the next uh, public hearing. Next item on our agenda, um, item 8.1. Uh, planning regulation amendment to prohibit crematories. Um, 7.3 has been continued. This is my item and if you don't mind, I'm just gonna take a quick minute to, uh, to moat these folks. <laughs> uh, hopefully I didn't accidentally demote a commissioner like I did before. <laughs> Are we all still here? Raise your hand if you're not here. Oh, somebody raised their hand. No, okay. All right, yes, this is my item. So if you'll bear with me for a second, I need to share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, All right. Can you all see that? Good. So this is a proposed uh, planning regulation amendment to prohibit crematoriums in Emeryville. By way of background, on February 2nd of this year, Councilmember Bowders requested and received majority support from the 
discuss to the council for a future discussion item about prohibiting crematories. And on April 6th, the council had that discussion and directed staff to uh, move forward and prepare a planning regulation amendment. Under the planning regulations, the uh, city council does have the ability to initiate planning regulation amendments. And so they did that. Uh, the planning commission public hearing on this obviously is tonight. Uh, the city council hearing is scheduled for July 6th and then second reading, assuming first reading passes would be July 20th. And then the effective date of the ordinance would be on August 19th. Uh, the definition of a crematory uh, is in the planning regulations, human or animal cremation facilities. There's a related use classification that's called funeral homes, mortuaries and mausoleums. And this is defined as the care, prepar care preparation or keeping of the dead. This type uh, use type includes spaces for services and assembly. Um, the proposed amendment would not affect funeral homes, mortuaries and mausoleums, which are conditionally permitted in several zoning districts and the proposed ordinance would not change that. Concerning health issues, according to the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, crematories can produce emissions of fly ash, smoke, gas, and odor. Odors and visible emissions can be objectionable to some people on aesthetic grounds. Also, according to the Canadian National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health, um, crematory emissions include pollutants that are known to be toxic to humans and can increase the risks of heart disease, lung cancer, asthma, and adverse birth outcomes and exacerbate other conditions such as diabetes. There have been two existing crematories in Emeryville. One is the Apollo Crematorium at 4080 Horton Street, and that was operated by the Neptune Society from the 1980s right up until about five years ago. They actually still maintain a city uh, business license, but they don't do cremations at this site anymore. Our understanding is that the cremations are now done elsewhere and the ashes are brought to this facility for uh, delivery to the families. The other is Pacific Interment, which is at 1094 Yerba Buena Avenue on the Oakland border. Um, they received a conditional use permit from the Planning Commission back in 1992 and uh, they have operated there for almost 30 years without incident. And in fact, they were even named the best mortuary in the East Bay earlier this year by the East Bay Express. They may continue to operate under their existing use permit. This proposed amendment would not affect them. So here's what the proposal is. Uh, as you know, in the planning regulations, there is a matrix of uh, uses that are permission that are permitted, conditionally permitted and prohibited. And that table, this is just a, a small snippet from that table, but uh, across the top are all the zoning districts are listed and then down the side, all the use classifications are listed. And the table has X's for uses that are prohibited, uh, P for uses that are permitted and C for uses that require a conditional use permit. So for crematories, these are currently prohibited in all zoning districts except INL and INH, light industrial and heavy industrial. They are also prohibited in the uh, neighborhood retail overlay zone. Now, what that means is if the neighborhood retail overlay zone is combined with a district that does allow them, namely INL and INH, then they would still be prohibited in that portion that was in the NR overlay zone. There actually are uh, a couple of blocks uh, along Hollis Street at the north end of town that are in the INL or INH zoning district and that have the NR overlay. And in those areas, crematories would be prohibited even though they are allowed in the base zones with a conditional use permit. So the proposal would be to change these two C's to X's so that the crematories would now be prohibited in both industrial zones and also to just eliminate this X in the NR overlay because it would become redundant. You don't need an X there if you've got X's all the way across here. Uh, these are the findings that are required to be made for a planning regulation amendment. And uh, staff believes that these findings can be made and the findings are contained in the uh, resolution that is before you tonight. Concerning environmental review, uh, this proposed amendment is not a project under section 21065 of the Public Resources Code, therefore not subject to CEQA, but even if it were, 
uh, it would still be exempt from environmental review under the common sense exemption because it can be seen with certainty that there's no possibility that it may have a significant effect on the environment. Uh, and so our recommendation is that you adopt the resolution approving the proposed amendment to the planning regulations and recommending that the city council adopt the amendments. That concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Charlie. Um, are there any questions from the commissioners at this time? Okay. Seeing no questions, um, there's, I am, yeah, this is the only presentation, right, Charlie? Yes. That's, okay. There's no applicant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm so I'm going to, I'm going to open public comment then. <laughs> um, this, this now is it's the time. Uh, I'm What's sorry, that? Chair Thompson, this is a public hearing. Uh, that's, yeah, sorry, that's what I meant, but. It's um, just, just semantics. Yes, now is the time for the public hearing on this item. Um, anyone who wishes to make comments uh, related to this item should have begun submitting the online comment speaker comment card by now. Three minutes will be allowed for the city clerk to read your comments into the record. If you're per, um, participating in tonight's meeting via Zoom, uh, please use the raise your hand feature. If you're calling in, please use uh, press star nine and the clerk will call oh. upon you at the appropriate time. Okay, so um, Charlie, do, are there, uh, have any comments been received by online comment card or has anyone raised their hands to make an audio comment? Um, uh, there are no, well, I see an online speaker card now for the last item, but it just re was received one minute ago. So I'm afraid they missed the boat on that one. Although we can certainly forward that to the commission. Uh, but on this item, I see no online speaker cards. I did have one raised hand, but that was because I inadvertently demoted uh, our attorney to an attendee. So I brought her back. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but there are no other raised hands. Okay, great. Uh, hearing no additional requests to make comments at the public hearing portion, uh, the, the public hearing portion of this uh, item is now closed. Okay, so um, just bring this back to the commission for deliberation. Um, Commissioner Chafe. Any comments? No, no substantial comments. I just want to say that um, I have a lingering thought in my mind that if we don't allow this source in Emeryville, where is it going to go? Um, and my hope is that it doesn't go to a, a more vulnerable community um, than the population we have in Emeryville, um, but that will not stop me from supporting this. So. Thank you, Commissioner Chafe. Commissioner Mendez? Um, I don't think I have any comments. I, I feel like I'm in full support also of this amendment. Okay. Commissioner Zipko? I am in agreement with Commissioners Mendez and Chief. Apologies. I have nothing further to add. Commissioner Keller? Thank you, Commissioner Zipko. No comment. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Simons? No comment for me. Thanks. Okay. Vice Chair Young? Uh, no comment either. Thank you very much. Okay, I think that is everyone. Um, I don't have any comments either. I support uh, moving forward with this. Um, Charlie, do you have what you need at this point? Uh, well, we need a motion and a second and a vote. I'll make the motion that, to. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution. I can I'll second, second it. <laughs> I believe that was moved by Commissioner Keller and seconded by Commissioner Zepko. Fine. All right, on the motion, uh, Commissioner Chafe? Aye. Commissioner Keller? Aye. Commissioner Mendez? Aye. Commissioner Simons? Commissioner Aye. Simons? Uh, Commissioner Zepko? Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Young? Aye. And Chair Thompson? Aye. Seven eyes. The motion is approved. We will forward your recommendation to the city council. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, so next on the agenda, planning commissioner comments. Are there any planning commissioner comments? Okay, fantastic. Um, so officially then I will adjourn this meeting. The time is 923. Thank you everyone. <laughs>